we're gonna start off like uh, we're gonna start slowly, and you're gonna see today is a bit of, like it's a it's a workshop that's very applied. So I guess let's start. Let's share the. Um, I'm very excited this way. I just been telling you I haven't slept for two days. I'm super excited about today. So I want to share all of this. Uh, Rita's here is an awesome uh, co co uh, co host. <laughs> so okay, so let's start sharing the presentation. Okay, I'll I'll give you a moment to read this. And this is uh, hopefully will be a platform to what's coming. So let's start by saying welcome, everybody. I'm super, we are super, super happy to do this. I think, uh, I'm sorry, I'm a bit hyped up more than usual because it's something that I love, love, love that I want to share with you. Uh, as you may know, uh, my name is Michelin Amar. I'm Filmaki Pichak Pedagogical. And today we're going to talk about experiential mathematics. And my, to my luck and my privilege, my co-host Rita <laughs> will be presenting herself in a minute. She agreed <laughs> to co-host with me, which is awesome. Go ahead. Yeah, this is an honor for me to, to be here with you guys. So I'm uh, very happy. So uh, uh, like Micheline said, my name is uh, Rita Nasip and I'm a pedagogical consultant for math and science. So here, hopefully, by the end of this workshop, we will be able to recognize the benefit of, ex of experiential math, experience many different uh, math differently with Kolb's model, um, rediscover the art of questioning through teaching and learning, and of course, accessing a collection of resources, which is always great to have. So here, uh, the uh, agenda, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to start by asking you what does experiential math means to you then we're gonna do some activity then we're gonna talk and think about it then we're gonna have a break but the break will be like depending on uh, uh, maybe after let's apply it so we're gonna do a third activity which is uh, let's apply it then we're gonna go more like into theory you know what's called model and how we did the, this workshop and yeah. of course, the resources, which are like super nice. <laughs> and just to add, no, what well, we did something different here is we sprinkled the resources where we thought it'll be applicable versus at the end giving you a list. We gave you the list also at the end. But we also put the resources after the section. So you'll see. Awesome. So first, uh, like uh, here we have, we're, we're only like, um, we're not too many, but uh, we wanted to know like, what does experiential math means to you? So um, you can like enter uh, all of your answers. So we you can add more than one answer. We can do that, huh, Micheline? We can add Yeah, more. absolutely. We, we, we gave you, we could give, we're gonna put uh, the, um, we'll put the link in the chat. Or if you wanna have uh, your phone available for a QR code, uh, it's up to you. But I'll put both. We'll put the, the link in the chat if you want to access the link right away. Or if you want to use your QR code, your camera, so you can see, uh, you can use both tools. It's up to you. But please uh, go ahead and... Uh, uh, for me, it's doing something. Or we can just talk about it if you don't want to write the answer. Well, just to let you know, if you ever try to use WhoopClap in your classroom, this is what it would look like. You would get uh, you would get questions where people could like respond, but notice that it's anonymous. So anyone in the class could actually use this, you know. And anyway, we're both showing you like the app and the point. So you see, we got a couple of answers saying while well, doing something hands-on, experiential math. So these are. These are these are things you could um, use in your classroom. If you let's say you want to get everybody's insight on, on on things without necessarily uh, knowing who it is, but at least to have a like a pulse. Uh, yeah. So yeah, student based learning, whatever, whatever insight you may get um, or from your student or from the participant. This is this is one way of you could demo it. So I'll stop the sharing. The whole idea behind here is just for us, just for us to to get a point of what's your view on it, right? And then we're gonna we're gonna jump in. So so 
All right. So this. <laughs> now we've got our first polls of what you guys thought about the experiential math. Now let's go through it. Okay. So let's do this. Okay. So we're going to start off with activity number one. Yes. And uh, I don't know if everybody's familiar in uh, with the math and three acts. Math and three acts. Anybody's everybody's familiar with that or not really? No. Okay. So let's do this. It's awesome. Yes. I'm yes. super happy that you're not. <laughs> <laughs> so now we're going to do the activity. So we're going to ask you to watch a video. And uh, the question is, what question comes to your mind? So basically, we're doing it like um, we would do it like with uh, any uh, student the activity. So yeah, just for you to read this before we start the video. Let's have the yeah. conversation here. Yeah. So notice that in the video over here, all it is is you had a statement at the beginning and something happened. Now, what questions may come to mind? We can. Who has more? Okay. It's a good question. Right? That's. If you're the person looking to grab the glass of soda, you're going to want the one that has more. The one on the left looks like it has more, but that's just because it's taller. Uh -huh. oh. So I could see how this could be like a volume type question. Yeah. A question for, for me is, it, this, following your thinking, uh, your thought is, is it because the one on the right is, is like wider that necessarily maybe it gives me the illusion that is maybe less because it's just wider. The other one is taller. Yep. So could they be the same? And, but yeah, which one has the bigger quantity? You know, these are questions that comes to mind. And obviously I want to have the more, right? If, yep. you know. And then yeah. you could get them to, if, if you actually had these glasses, you could get them to calculate the volume of soda in each one to figure out which yeah. one does have more. Yeah. So it's, it's a good introduction to teaching volume or figuring yeah. out volume. Yeah. And you could and probably even get graduated <laughs> cylinders out and actually measure it. Yeah. And then the think, about it also. think about it also. Has uh, we all in a way, in a moment in our lifetime, had experienced where, you know, being younger or older, we wanted to have even <laughs> quantities. Right? No, my kids don't fight over that, Michelin. <laughs> so, so the idea here, notice that you show like the, the three act, the first act, like you saw over here, is like, just give it situation. And it has to make sense to the students. Like in, in, in my case, when I saw this video with Rita, when we were looking at them, I said, oh my God, this is like so typical. I would want to oh, know yes. because I lived through it <laughs> all my life with three kids, you know, impossible, you know? So um, yeah. yeah. I don't know if Jessica and Michelle want to add something. I know you're busy, but in case uh, you want to add something, what, what this like trigger questions in your mind? For me, I thought it was a great way to motivate students to answer any question about equivalent solid. Mm -hmm. you know, what was the point type of thing? <laughs> so That's you will get um, uh, more soda. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's nice. So, so here it's, it's the important thing is that the student, you know, they formulate a question and in the first act. So they, they tell you like, what's the question they come to mind? And sometimes they say question that doesn't even, um, target makes sense. makes sense but it's good for them you know to to make them start from what's their intuition and to go to you know here the question it's gonna be which one has more liquid in yeah. it yeah and michelle you wanted to add something to it yeah i just one of my big things with uh when i start because being the english teacher brain that i have um, I, when I start teaching math, I explain to the students that, you know, English, you can write a short story and kind of lob a grenade and you can 
you know, say a lot of things and still be pretty successful and possibly pass your exam in situations like in extreme states. But with math, one plus one is, is, is two. It, there's no, it's like, it's, uh, you know, there's, it's very um, specific. And so uh, this would be a good video for me to show them that how important perception is versus verifying really what the facts are and really what, what is there. And, and to start with that, getting that transition from that, that subject thing. That's how I kind of would see that, which I think, and everything else that you've mentioned too. I, I, thank you, Michelle, so, so much, because this is a super interesting point you brought. And this is funny because we had the same kind of brainstorm together. And this is a point we didn't think about this to show the difference between qualitative and quantitative when you're you're having, especially in math, right? Because both, they're both important for whatever, like what you're teaching, because you could teach math without numbers. And this is really important because then you're looking at like a deeper understanding of a concept versus when we're looking at numbers in math, we're looking at only at the mechanic technically, like you're just checking things, right? So they're both very important, but it's important to take the numbers out. And what's important, one thing somebody had mentioned also here, everyone has something to say about this, right? Anyone, your weak, weak student could say, well, like, like Laura had mentioned, which one is the <laughs> more, I just want to have the, the, the glass that has the most liquid or let's say, you know, the most alcohol in it, if you want to, if our young adults would say, or our youngest one, I want to have the, the glass with the most juice in it, right? For, for to somebody who could describe this in more like uh, equivalency and get fancy with this, right? So yeah, definitely. This this is a, a, a video in a way, like it's a situated trigger conversation among everyone at all level in our math class. So, okay. Yes. And but, it, it but, can be um, like, uh, like Jessica said too, like uh, solid versus uh, liquid. So, so we can work it like in many different ways, the same problem, depending on our intention. Well, we can teach whatever we want with it, so. And it's to bring to come back also to basic is to trigger questioning right in this case and also to come up with the to agree in a classroom if you bring something like that is to agree on what kind of question you want to solve also right so here if we if if it's a, if it's okay with everybody can we see like uh, can we agree on the question like uh, which one has the most liquid or would we want to reformulate the question in another way that everybody can agree so. You see how here we kind of, the problem that we all kind of shared in terms of questioning, we could come up with a question that could actually uh, set the table, like we say, like, this is the question we want to, we want to answer, right? So which the question case, is, which one, <laughs> which one has, has the bigger more? volume? <laughs> which one has more? Which yes, one has or, more? Yes, or the bigger volume. Okay. So now we're going to go to the act two. Um, what do we need to solve this problem? So step so, one, if you take a look at the video and you say, okay, generate questions, clarify the question. Now, what do I need to solve? Like, okay, which one has most? So what do I need, right? So what do you guys think we need to solve for volume here? We need the, we, well, if we actually have these glasses in front of us, we would need a ruler. We need to measure the radius or the, probably the diameter would be easier. And we need to measure the height of the liquid. Why? Like that's basically, my, <laughs> <laughs> well, now I'm doing it like, because like, as if you were like students, you know? So I would ask if I was in a group, I would ask, why would you need to measure the radius? Why would you need to measure the the height? So it brings the, it helps the other student to hear, you know, uh, how we see the conversation, which is basically the most important part of the act two, is that instead of telling the student, you're gonna need the radius and the height, it comes from them. Well, I'm gonna need some measures, you know, to be able to, to do it. I know it looks like a cylinder, so, okay the shape is like a cylinder so i i had to identify the shape and yeah michelle yes. go ahead um i was thinking i kind of off of what she said i kind of then my mind went faster and i went why not provide a couple different tools beside it for act two 
and, and but the easy way for me was like a, vol, a volume cylinder where you would just pour the volume into the cylinder and it would tell you immediately how much but then I like the idea of having the rulers and because right now I'm really big on you know getting my teeth my students to select the proper tools like you know uh, the ex example I use you can stir a cake with a screwdriver but it's a lot better with a blender or a spoon so these tools and then getting them to start selecting but uh, sort of that's you know my easy way would be get a volume cylinder but depending of course what you're teaching so um yeah i, I would do both i would oh. use a graduated yeah use no 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 but my idea is i would use a graduated cylinder measure it and then also calculate it using a ruler and then compare yeah wow and and what about that's like see like this is real yeah like this if we calculate it, this is what I get. If I measure it, this is what I get. We should get close. Well, there's always mistakes. So you'll get close to the same answer. You want yes. the exact same answer. But I think that would be more meaningful to them because it's not just, well, I plug in the number into a formula. I get this. It's Amazing. I plug the number in. I got this. I measured it. I got this. It's the same thing. It works. So you basically, so, you're going to verify the theory. Like, does the formula yeah. match the reality? Yes. And if there's like a bit of a difference, why? You know what? So are we close enough to say that the model that I, that I have is a good one or not? Yeah. But, but notice yeah. what's interesting, what's interesting that between Laura and Michelle, you both thought of different ways of doing the same thing. And what's interesting is Imagine this in a classroom where you have different people have different ways of looking at this and they both tell you, well, oh, I think I would do it this way. And then you may say, well, no, I would do it this way. And, and the whole idea is, well, what if we try both of our ways and check, you know, is there the right way? No, there's no right way. There's many, many ways of doing the same thing. And notice also here, the conversation started because as a teacher right away, we said, well, there's formulas, obviously we need measurement, but students also like sometimes, like you say, the idea of testing it through cylinders, Laura, this is brilliant because they found another way to go around it. But then, but then the fact that also we said, don't we give them measurement, like with rulers and stuff, somebody maybe wouldn't have thought about it, but the fact that there's this whole conversation and exchanges, there's, there's the, formula notion of measurements, right? There is the measurement itself, and there is other ways to verify these measurements. So there's a lot going on on the same simple concept that usually in classroom, we'll just put on the board, say volume formula plug in, right? So there's so much more going on in terms of conversation. And if, especially if you keep tab of all of these conversation on the board or have like a, like have a, a, an exchange, right? You're, you're, you're deepening, you know, you wouldn't have caught yes. this up, you know? They understand at the, like, I guess at the end, we would want them to understand why the formula is something that we use in math, you know? So basically you don't always have a cylinder. And sometimes, you know, you order stuff online. You don't have the possibility to measure your things you know, unless you have them physically with you. So, um, so here it, it gives like the theory versus, okay, I did it in a, with the experience. So it gives them meaning. It gives them deeper comprehension of the, the formula and where it comes from. And why did I use a ruler? Why this kind of ruler? Why not this one? Uh, the whole idea, the whole idea also that just to reinforce what Rita was saying is, is you're giving the, to the map, the, the formula, the abstract part, which is the formula comes in second. Intuition is first, you're validating intuition. We're just building that knowledge that you're doing more, more math than you realize. And it's not only plugging in with like mechanically, but there is meaning to this and there's real connection to <laughs> a simple thing as like which class has more right so the whole idea is to have those exchanges and also it's good for a teacher to know a starting point and how the student think also because we know a lot of our students struggle so but listening to them you could see almost like their reasoning their, their where, where do where's the starting point to kind of 
just talk to them, <laughs> you know, to stimulate those those conversation. And uh, what's fun about that is that even the student who struggles in math, he can participate because they all have filled glass of water before, so so they know this. Yeah. So let's let's move on to the to the second part. So. So just to recap, first one, you give a, a situation, you brainstorm on all kinds of questions that comes to mind. Third thing is you identify the question that you want to answer. Then you question the students is like, what do I need to answer this and have this conversation? So once, once they get to the question, the clarification of the question, then we could go to the next step, say, well, okay, how would we be able to solve something like that? And that's where you stimulate this conversation about different way of solving the, the situation. And from there, now you get them to do act two, which is once Rita is ready to share with us, <laughs> you'll notice now you'll get them to work on the solutions. Say, okay, go ahead and do it. Give me, give me a solution. Give me a strategy. Give me how you got, how you get the answer. So this is the part that, Technically, now, if I tell you, okay, uh, Laura, okay, Michelle, okay, Jessica, Manon, go ahead and find me a solution with all your suggested strategies, you will go ahead and do it. So, for example, uh, Laura was talking about measurement. She probably will take all these measurements and calculate volumes. Michelle probably say, well, I have two cylinders. I'm probably going to put them in my cylinders and check whatever. So this is the part of it where it's the application part. So we have, if we're just for fun, okay, we can't measure because you're, you're at a distance, but if you have to actually calculate this as a student, what would you do? Take a minute and calculate it on a piece of paper just for fun, okay? So technically, we, I know here we, we're just gonna show you uh, like a slide two. This is a shared document that Rita was showing you. So this is something that I would put, give my student. I would say, okay, you do it. And then if we go to slide two, so notice here, that will be something that I would like tell them upload on that slide. Or if you have a whiteboard, uh, uh, put it on your, on the whiteboard or some sort of display. It has to be a public display. All right. Where they go and, and defend their, their way of doing things. Okay. So. And it, there's no right or wrong answer at that point. There's just a way of doing at this point. And then the student among each other, they could kind of talk about it, right? Oh, why did you do it this way? Oh, I think this is right. Oh, I think this is wrong, right? You're stimulating conversation, but now we're talking about application, right? Strategy, how you do it. And the point here at this step is to get them to verbally discuss it use word and an explanation like defend your strategy or even like explain to me how you did this and 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 if they're going to tell you what well, i'm going to show you say no no let's use words and here is to develop their vocabulary and their explanation because if they're able to um verbalize it it means they they were able to synthesize it in their brain they're able to organize the information and if they don't know how to do it you guide them through it say okay so step one what did you do you could guide them with question to kind of get their thought organized because this is at the end of the day when they're gonna do their 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 assignment or whatever they're gonna they have to develop a better communication on how you ex to, sh to share you know your thoughts and i know a lot of our students have difficulty getting their thought organized or maybe like have their step in order so this is another way to say okay let's practice this okay defend why how, why, what did you do here? Show me, show us, right? And by the student showing, they're developing communication skills, which is one of our competency. And this is a very, very important one in everything in life in general, right? So, and having that kind of back and forth debate and asking question, oh, you did this here. Oh, you forgot the diameter. You took the radius instead of the diameter. The R, oh, you took the wrong measurement. Okay, so if you replace this, do we have the same answers and have this conversation, right? Yes, it's uh, it's it's good, you know. They uh, compare their uh, 
way of doing it uh, with the other student but like laura said in the beginning like she was uh, telling like what if my uh, height is higher is it because it's wider so now you can have all those conversation about okay what if i double the radius now what would happen you know and then you're gonna have the the student who's gonna make like a hypothesis hypothesis <laughs> exactly <laughs> So who are going to make a hypothesis about like, oh, my radius is double, so it's going to double or is it going to like be four times bigger because, you know, of the square and the, so you're going to have like super nice um, uh, reasoning discussion. of the discussion with the students. So it, it gives like the meaning that um, geometric formulas, they are like also uh, uh model that depends you know the variables depends on each other you know so if if i have a higher height my volume is going to be bigger if i have a higher radius what would happen to my volume you know and and all these relationships starts making sense for them and and this is the fun part when you're focusing on strategy and having these kind of conversation about relations because this is one of the hardest thing to work with the student. You could also you could literally have different sizes of glasses and test it. You know, like I mean, I'm not saying you know, like you could take it a step further. If this is if you have somebody a student who have difficulty imagining, like Yita says, you're talking about relationship. Like okay, there's so much in this glass. What happened if I double this glass? well they can predict let's calculate let's test it you know then it becomes like you're creating another way of thinking oh so relationship so if i increase this what happened is it the direct increase <laughs> it's not you know so and, uh, yeah. you're coming back to this one i'm sure that some students are going to measure the height of the glass not of the liquid mm -hmm. so but maybe for them, it's because they're thinking which one has more. It's because obviously when I fill my glass, I fill it to the maximum level. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but that's not the question here, you know. <laughs> so it's to have those conversations with the student that sometimes, you know, they can be an obstacle for their reasoning because, you know, they really do think that when you fill a glass, you fill it up to the max, you know. And uh... <laughs> yeah. And, and you bring in an interesting point, Rita. It could be also like, how am I, am I missing? If somebody's saying, well, I would have liked my glass to the rim. And you say, okay, great. Well, how much are you missing? So you see how you can make it even more complex. So you could give a level, like you could up it up a little or, you know, you know, clarify, you know, constraints, like we say, you know. So, so this, is, this is act two. And actually, now that brings us to act three. Yes. If I'm not mistaken, Act uh, Three, for Act Three, where you actually finish up the video, right? Finishing up the video, it's actually watch the solution. Literally, have somebody literally measure it, like uh, the teacher, <laughs> like having those two cylinder and actually measure the volume, and yeah. for to have this conversation. So here's the Act Three. And notice here, it's intentional with ounces. By the way, these videos are made in Canada. They're not American. This is like <laughs> that mayor will talk about the person who put it together and his intention to make it in ounces because most of our drinks, if you go in most of these tools are in ounces, first of all. And if it's metric, you wanted to add a step of conversion in it. So there's the level of complexity. You just wanted to get them. If you measure something and... And notice it's not a direct answer. Just when you, you you see it, one is eight, one is four. It's just to so that the one on the left has more, right? The exact number doesn't matter. Your measurements are all metric and this is in ounces, right? So the student is gonna say, but it's not the same numbers. Okay, if you really wanna focus on the number, well, go convert it. But the point here is to check the relationship. There's the, to answer the question really, the one on the left has more than the one on the right, right? So. I don't know if you, uh, what do you think so far? Make sense? So is this is this a good problem, uh, teachers? <laughs> what do you guys think? And, and why do you think, if it is, why? 
it honestly depends on the level of math, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's a very good question. I like the way it's done. It all depends. Is this something is volume or is equivalent solids a topic that's discussed in your classroom? Like, is that part of your, you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But intention but is everything. You're yeah. so right. Yeah. yeah. Um, on a different note, too, I was just thinking of the whole ounces thing. And I was thinking cups would probably be better than ounces because I don't know about you guys, but I never measure anything in ounces. When I take out a measuring cup, I measure things in cups. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But this is, you bring in an amazing and amazing point, Laura, because the whole point being in ounces, being in cups, being in milliliters, it doesn't matter. It's the unit. Just the fact that you could have even that conversation and say, listen, yeah. at the end of the day, a unit is just to describe something. I'm right? just not sure our students know what an ounce is. No, no. <laughs> but it's, it's a good question because, you know, uh, we don't take the time, you know, with the students usually to, to ask them which one is better, you know? Yeah, which, which unit, unit do you use to measure? And That's it's, it. it's good because sometimes, you know, uh, like uh, I'm going to say something, okay? Uh, I don't know how to say it in English. Decimetre. Like, when Decimetre. do we use this decimeters? You know? Usually the student doesn't know how to answer to this question. They're going to understand centimeter or meter, but decimeter, that's not very common. Or deca. <laughs> or deca, you know? So it's, it's a very good conversation to ask with the students. So here, why is this person using answers when here we use cups? Uh, cups. Which one would be better, you know? But of course, it comes to the, the how precise I want to be, you know? I'm going to use answers if I want to be more precise than if I want to use cups, you know? But uh, it's... Uh, for the student, he has to understand that sometimes, like the unit, depends on what we're measuring. And but and one other yeah. thing that came to mind, sorry, is when we do the calculations, you'll get an answer in like centimeters cubed. Yes. And then when you measure it in a graduated cylinder, you'll get the answer in milliliters. Because often our students don't associate centimeters with volume. Like to them, it's just, it's a length. They don't realize that, well, centimeters by centimeters by centimeters gives you a volume. They don't make that connection. Yeah, because it's like a small square and then the milliliters is like liquid, you know? So they don't- Yeah, No, they don't make the connection that centimeters yeah. cubed is also a volume. Yes, it's true. And some students will, will stop at centimeter cube, huh? Like yeah, you said. they don't say, oh, well, I know one cubic centimeter is one yeah. mil, but I'm not so sure our students know that. Yeah, yeah, but can I measure like with my, you know, cup uh, in uh, centimeter cubes? It's not going to measure with that. My cylinder, my uh, graduate, it's going to measure yeah. in... Oh, yeah, yeah, but like no. in, in um, the medical field, for example, they don't say millimeters, they say cc's. And CC stands for centimeters cubed. And this students don't make the association that that's the same as a milliliter. Yes, but maybe but, because we like we don't like uh, this, th this kind of activities allow like the student to understand why we go till the millimeters, why we don't stop at centi centimeter cube. Because but, on, on the theory part, when they do it on the paper, when they arrive at centimeter cube, it's a good way to compare volumes to. Yep. But in reality, when we measure, we don't measure in centimeter cubes. No, we don't. We don't. So that's why we have to convert them. So here it's another discussion that is very, you see, I didn't think about it, but it's uh, uh, before we did the presentation, I didn't think about it, but it's it's a good conversation to have with the students so they understand that why do we go from metric to uh, liquid? Yeah, the centimeter cube to uh, I'm sorry, milliliters. <laughs> really milliliters. Yeah, yeah. But you know what? It's interesting that you brought it up because you know, with what Jessica had said before, you know, when you're talking about quantities and equivalency. We're talking about also in this case, different way of expressing units, right? And, and 
in a, in a problem that you give like paper and pen, the student might write the right unit because they've seen it and, or like how they say memorized it, that this matches this and this is how it's supposed to be, but not understanding it. The fact that you bring it back with the CC, like for example, I'm bringing real life. If anybody here is interested in going to the medical field, you'll hear the word CC all the time. What does that mean? You just guys used it by calculating this. And this is another way of also representing it and having this outlined early on and repetitively brought back over and over, it might make the connection. You're mechanically making the connection for them because you're right, Laura, our student would never pick this in a million year because it's not something that they would think about. And no. honestly, as a teacher, personally, I never thought about it either to teach it that way too, to say, oh, well, centimeter, I always put centimeter cube equal ML, but to them, it was like, whatever, you know, it's just mechanical knowledge. But now if you actually get them to measure some things, get them to like being in a, in a cylinder, being like physical, you know, like an mm -hmm. ice cube and make it melt it and see that that ice cube that I'm measuring in centimeters, once it melts, it's the same quantity, like let's say in a cylinder, probably, then they could visually understand that whatever I'm measuring with my ruler, that ice cube, let's say, yep. the minute it melts that it's in a different form, like a liquid form, it's the same volume, right? But some, some of our students, like, you know, <laughs> they need to see it or they need to kind of be told, they need to kind of live it to understand it. So yeah, I, I did that in the past. I, I actually, I had one student who had very difficult understanding more than what I explained or where he could see. And I did bring, unfortunately it was so funny to do that because you had to get an ice cube and get them physically to measure it with a ruler and then put it in a pot and wait for it to melt and actually measure it in a graduated cylinder for them to prove to them that this is actually the same volume. And you can measure it in centimeters and you can measure it in milliliters. And it, look at this, it's identical. And if we have this conversation about why isn't it not exactly the same, then we could talk about, you know, it's not the same because when you melt, I dropped a bit on the counter, I dropped a bit in, you know? So that's also math being an exact science is not really an exact science. Truthfully, it's not an exact, it's the closest to an exact science, but it's not. It's an approximation of anything. And, and that's also, we have to kind of humanize math because when it becomes too perfect, perfection is the standard we can't reach, even us teachers, you know? So um, so that that's the conversation to, to bring it down to math. Yes, it's the closest thing to, to an exact science, but it's not exact. With what we know, this is what we, everything we do is an approximation, right? So. And I feel like, like this is good. It brings a deeper understanding because the students, okay, they memorize volume in centimeters cubed, but they don't understand. They don't know why. They've just been taught that centimeters cubed is for three dimensional shape. Like there's no, you know what I mean? And, and sometimes yeah. they don't it's even like make that broke. connection. They don't make that connection. They're just like, yes. I was they told don't even this is what it is. Sometimes they don't, they don't even connect that centimeter cubes. This it's a volume. It's no. a volume. They just don't get it sometimes. So here, we, yeah. here we're gonna have like the, the the student when he doesn't have a deeper understanding and he do it mechanically, well, he's not gonna be able to verify his answer. Does it make sense that this is my answer? Sometimes, like we get weird, like volume is bigger than the 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 like for example when you have a, a, a juice and you you fill it into small um, glasses and sometimes they give you like a bigger volume than the the yeah, logic the, con the first container who, who's supposed to be the biggest one you know so and you're like okay so you made a mistake here and does it make sense your answer so now we can you know make them be able to also verify their answer in into a more instinctive way also well it's it's exactly what Rita said so if let's say I have a bottle of water of you know it's one liter and then I pour into five glasses some of our, our the answers it's more than one liter and you're looking at it and say well how could it be if it should be less because I poured it in five glasses the sense making of the answers it's it's so important 
But that's your, just to bring back to your point. Yes, they memorize, they wrote, they don't understand. And that's something maybe with these kind of opportunities to have these kind of st stations once in a while is to bring back to say, listen, I know you're doing this. It's right and it's mechanically perfect, but do you really understand? It's just to bring back the questioning as like, let, let's take a step further and see, do we really understand? There is, it is it is a lot funner when we understand than when we don't, <laughs> you know? And, and just to go back to a point that you had mentioned before or, or, or a thought, something that happened with me as a teacher too, is I would see students, let's say, do super well on, on a concept, like you give them something they're able to do, and then you bring them into a chemistry or a physics or a, another course completely that's not math related, and you ask the same skill in it, and they're completely not able to do it. And yet you say, well, you did super well in math. How come you can't isolate the variable in, in science? And they're looking at you like, what are you talking about? And that shows us that they memorize and they don't understand. So anyways, so uh, just to, to link it to actually studies and research, what we're talking to answer this is a good problem or not, is actually based on the mathematical intervention framework, which this is this is a collection of, of um, of how to teach math with deeper understanding that the ministry had actually published. Um, it's not translated by the way, but this is, we translated it on us. So this is the unofficial <laughs> translation <laughs> if you want. Um, there's a part that they talk about what is what makes a good problem, okay? And teaching concept, then solving a problem, mobilize, mobilizing them, immediately after learning uh, can lead students to believe they must always use the same, the last concept. So if we show something and then we give them a problem, they just remember that this is what the teacher wants me to do. So whatever she taught me, I'm gonna keep on replying, applying it. Um, the students should not be able to determine the path to the solution from the start. So if I give them a problem and they know exactly what to do, that means it's a one-step problem. So if I know it's like, I'm saying, oh, John went to the market and he bought, apples and oranges, uh, two apples and three oranges, well, how much did he bought? The student, without finishing the problem, they know they're gonna have to add, right? So it's not stimulating enough. There's no thinking. It's just automatic application, right? But a good problem should have the following characteristic. First, it is clearly formulated. So the question has to be clear, not a lot of sub questions in the same question, you know, um, in a form of a written, oral or even illustrated statements so that it can be understood by all students. So it has to be clear the question, like what we did in the problem. What is the question we're trying to solve? It is stated in such a way as not to uh, induce a particular solution strategy or algorithm. So there's not one way of doing it. There's many, many ways. Like the conversation we had between Laura and Michelle, I would do it this way, I would do it this way, I would do it this way, multiple way. It arouses the curiosity and maintain the interest of the student. We all want to know how much, which glass has more because we lived it. We all poured liquid in glasses and we always, you know, we want to have the most, right? Um, it encourages reflection and mathematical exchanges like we had. It is accessible to all students while offering them a challenge. So you have your weakest student to your strongest student could contribute. A weaker student could say, well, I think that this, this class is taller than the other. And that could be just enough to have them participate because in other situations, you'll have an empty page and they'll have, they wouldn't have participated at all. So this way, at least they'll be part of the conversation. They contribute, whatever it is, it'll still be valid. It lends itself to use a variety of solving strategies, exactly like we talked about, and it appeals to students' experience. Again, they've done it before. It results one or more correct answers. And like you said, even if we calculate and we get different answers, we can even discuss the answers that we got and why we have it differently. So uh, this is based on actual research and, 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 uh, and um, studies that was done. So let's try another strategy. This is, I don't know how many, has anybody heard about number talk? No? Yes, I mean, I'm so happy. Two for two today. Yes. So um, number talk. And by the way, just to go back uh, on the first on the first activity, the first activity, there is somebody actually who put 
uh, over, I think if what, I think now there's a thousand kind of yeah. tiny videos. There's many, is, many, 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 uh, many, many videos. And they're all, somebody took the time to separate them for adult ed in levels. So you'll have a collection to pick and choose on the topic and the video, the three act videos. So this would be a really awesome way to, to, to have it, to add to your library. Number talk. Um, number talk is another way of stimulating conversation. And um, go ahead. Let's let's get them let's, to test it first. Yeah, and then let's we'll do talk one. Yeah. Yes. So here the question is, which one doesn't belong and why? So take a moment, think about it, and let's share. And here uh, we did put the, the like uh, Google chat. <laughs> Yeah, you can put it, well, you can put it in Google <laughs> chat or we can discuss it. We can discuss well, it. About it. But in a class, we can always ask those kind of questions in the Google chat with the students. So uh, they answer you uh, and you see all the answer appearing on the board. So we can start with uh, Jessica. I am stuck. Like which one doesn't belong, right? Yes. Yeah. I am, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I would say be anything. Yeah. There's no good or bad answer. That's right. Then I will, I will say the the last one bottom right, just because I don't like it. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> it's a weird shape, huh? <laughs> That's a good answer. It's fine. We'll hold on to that answer because that yes. would be something at a first look. <laughs> I would say too. But uh, Did yeah, someone then my say why would in. this one not belong? Any ideas? The others? My problem is it says which one. I can only figure out which two don't belong. Because I'm like looking at the, the the pyramids. I'm like the two at the top are both pyramids. So the, the bottom two don't belong. The two on the right both have circles in them. So they belong together. The two on the left have squares. They belong. <laughs> I, I cannot separate one from the four. I can separate two, but I cannot separate one. Love the observation. Yes, okay. I love it too. And Michelle, it's okay. Yeah. There's no good or right answer. Michelle. Well, I'm glad Rita said that. There's no good, <laughs> good, good and bad <laughs> answer. But my my instinct, and I've been trying to do the same thing, is is yeah, the six sided uh, cube square thing, because of just all the sides uh, compared to the lesser amounts and the other ones. But I know that's totally not mathematical. It's more instinctive. So. Yeah, yes. mm -hmm. it is mathematical, actually, by the way, <laughs> but you just don't know it. It's a it's a un point de fit. It's a perspective okay. in one uh, avec un point de fit. So that's why you see it. It's not very well done here. <laughs> you mean it's not drawn in the same perspective? Is that what you're trying to say? Yes. The other one are Cavalier and this one is um, your, your fancy sec three, you know, yes. shape drawing. You remember when you have one point of focus, two point of focus of projections? This is one point of focus projection. Well, if we can go through the solution. We picked this specifically because we know we have math teachers and this is, we wanted to kind of give you a little bit of a challenge because trust me, even I, when I looked at this and I was like, oh my God, how are we going to justify this? But, <laughs> it was you know, hard to see, you know, it took us a bit of time, but then I because me too you know when i did it the first one that was i was like it doesn't fit it was the one that was like drawn in a in a very yeah, weird true. way you know and i was thinking why is it not like really um uh prism droit like the other ones you know yeah, and, and then i, just, I realized it's c'est vraiment le point the fit the um, focus point yeah, that is different in this one and i just yeah. i just want to clarify i don't clear i don't can consider myself a math teacher <laughs> so the other two are much more uh, you know into it than I am for you know just having that always you know working in the math area so I'm not sort of diminuing diminuing whatever I can't even talk this morning it must be more don't worry it's all of us but you know what I mean <laughs> yes. but but you know what Michelle you, you're you're perfect for this because you rely on your intuition and yeah. just to tell you, your intuition is right. Me, mm. like, again, I just to, to compare, the first thing in me, like, when I looked at this problem, I'm a math teacher, and I'm like, yeah, there has to be a mathematical, cons like, and, like, a, a reason and explanation. So I went right away into my mathematical hat, 
and I already limited myself in a first instinct answer, right? And the minute I removed that hat, suddenly I was able to see it. And from intuition, I was able to get to my math hat, right? And this is exactly, honestly, this is what I have. Because when I looked at it the first time, the first thing I said, well, between all of them, the cone doesn't fit because it's standing straight. Everything else is tilted. And that's a good reason. And really, in a way, you take a look at it and you see, yeah. Well, um, if you take a look at the cylinder, well, there's no corners. So that doesn't fit because it doesn't have any corners, right? So where I had trouble is the other two. It wasn't chips. so easy. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, when we say there is no good or bad answer, it's because there isn't really. Each one of them, we can say a reason why they don't belong with the others. So like, for example, the cylinder that is tilted like that, it, it's not a, it's a, a solid it's not Projection. It's not a projection. No, it's no, just... no, pas un solide droit. You know, the height is not straight, it's tilted. Planted. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So the Planted, question yeah. here, would it make a difference for the volume? No. Uh, yes, Michelle. No. I, this is crazy, but it just brought me back to Sesame Street. And one of these things is not like the other. One of these things doesn't belong. I mean, yeah. this is uh yeah <laughs> that's what i'm thinking about that <laughs> i think the yeah. kids would enjoy that kind of or my students would enjoy that if you could make the humor into it too <laughs> it's easy this one to do and it's you can always start with something like that to activate you know the brain of the student and it makes them uh you know talk mathematics because you know they're gonna talk okay this one has a base a circle base even if there's two it doesn't matter uh, like we separate them to the idea here is just to talk about the shapes the how we see them uh, what are the difference between them um was it what is the difference between a cone and a pyramid you know for the student we can have those discussion but it just gives them you know the opportunity to express themselves about the 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 shapes and to uh to see how the others see to compare the way of seeing things to the the way that other people uh, see it too and it really it, it does help the student activate their brain so they start like this and then when you give them problem written problem maybe they're going to be more engaged because you know they they did their uh, exercise yeah and they connected also they connected to experience right so imagine this was put in a classroom individualized setting multi level multi like multi-level of math, multi-subject. So you'll have a conversation from level one to five about this. First of all, let's identify that this is 3D shape. So they're solids, you know, between 2D and 3D. How do we know? So recognize that this is solid. We're Hello, looking Darlene. at volume. We're looking at characteristics. We're looking about, you know, and, and this is a conversation that you could have like to kind of get the group together, you know? And, and regardless of what level, you could be in sec five math and not necessarily, you know, remember these characteristics about solids. So having that opportunity to have conversations with your sec three, especially sec three math, which is, this is probably going to hit them the most, right? Uh, but the sec two, uh, who, who just, le just learned volume solids and, and uh, you know, so this is a nice conversation to have and to build fluency also. And if you have a question about something, you, it's easier for you sometimes to ask a, like a peer than a teacher, because it might sound stupid. This is basic knowledge. I would never ask my teacher, well, how come this is called a pyramid? But I could ask my friend, say, well, why is it a pyramid? But somebody might say, well, because it has one point, you know, and it's, or, or whatever. The explanation becomes more, everyone can kind of contribute to this explanation. So. That being said, this is this is this is also from a research perspective. This is stimulates uh, how can I say it? fluency, uh, trigger questioning, trigger like curiosity, you know. So again, now if you ask me the same question we asked you before, is this a good problem, in your opinion? Yeah, and and yeah, why? I see none yeah i see nodding feel hit, free yeah. to speak <laughs> i mean if you're reviewing solids or if you're trying to explain solids to students i can see how this would be a very good problem 
because you, I, you can yeah. go on what like right they make the connection and you're like yeah this is like you just said this is a pyramid because this is a because yeah so it all depends on on what you're covering what what you need to talk about I think too, it could be intimidating. And until Rita said, there's no wrong answer that just sort of then opens it all up so that then they, their, their creativity and their, you know, they can draw on their experiences and what do they know about things? Whereas at first, you know, you might be intimidated to get the wrong answer. So mm -hmm. I think uh, how you, how you ask the question is probably important. Saying too. It, yeah. Saying at the beginning that there's no wrong answer. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. And just to add, and just to add this, this is a super, super area and opportunity to see also misconceptions, right? If you put something there and you have a conversation and somebody says, well, my teacher taught me this and you know, it's wrong. Mm -hmm. You could right away nip it in the butt because there's a lot of things that was taught maybe out of context. I'm not saying the teacher taught it wrong, but maybe out of context. And this is what they retained <laughs> and it could be false and 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 it's stuck so this is an opportunity to clear those moments because then you're listening to conversation and reasoning and people come in well i'll give you a trick you do it this way and that's where you come in and say yeah that trick works or doesn't work or you could clarify it because i've heard only things sometimes like only through conversation like whoa, 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 whoa this is uh, not totally right let's come out you know but you won't put your finger on it until you hear it shared you know and these are opportunities to clear misconceptions too yes another way it can be used in a classroom is like you could put it on the board again the first day and say and have these conversations through intuition you know laura like when you're saying this could be a summative at the end to review but it could be also like let's take a look at this and intuition you don't know nothing about solid yeah. and let's see what you guys could come up with and then hold this conversation and then bring it back at the end and say, now let's bring back that same picture and let's see what we know more and show them the increment of knowledge that they got. So but it, this is it, could, it yeah. could also be used to assess previous knowledge. Yes. Perfect. Yes. Of solids. Depending on yeah. your intention, it can go many, many ways. Um, but also uh, what I like about those kind of problem is that we're not focusing on the uh, production of the student. We're really focusing here on what he knows, what he's thinking. Uh, yeah. And this it brings another level in, in mathematics because usually we focus a lot on the production for the student, which is normal because you know, when we evaluate them, we evalu evaluate That's only the doing. production. So, so it is normal. But here would it like the student is a bit, I don't know if I say it right, relieved. He's, he doesn't have to do it handwritten, but he just have to use his voice. He expresses the way he see things. He yeah. expresses what he remembers. Like when you say like uh, what he knows bef from his experience before, we, this will help you like, um, this will help, I'm sorry, the student, you know, uh, go back in his memory and access it so. yeah and, and they don't have to do calculations which is kind of nice because often they get scared of that yes and it's fun let's bring back a bit the word fun because honestly if i have to do something that i feel i could contribute then i'm going to be engaged if i feel that everything i have to do i have to show way of doing then i'm like Ugh, you know and also let's not forget something our Students coming into our centers, they're traumatized with math, most of them, because they've been doing more wrong than right. And all their life, that red pen was all over their work. So you know what? To take a chance on, on anything they do, it's a lot of courage. Let's be honest. So when you put something like that on the board or, or like you stimulate them a different way, they kind of also you're almost giving them a disconnection of what they set themselves up to fail because remember we only redo what we know right so yeah and they're, them, they're scared to be wrong yeah. they're often scared yeah. to be wrong uh, and mistake mistake has the worst like the word mistake and wrong and doing you know yeah. and looking you know 
they're not good. It's like reconfirming yeah. that you're not good, that you're not allowed to make a mistake. <laughs> it's so strong and embedded in them because remember, they come to you, at least they're 16. So they had 16 years prior to you of them being reinforced, they're not good in math. So they walk into your glass knowing that they're not good in math and mistakes is bad and I'm not good. So throwing things differently at them when they're not expecting it is that's where sometimes almost like give the student a break from their kind of insecurity and in saying, okay, let me try. This is an interesting conversation. It's not yeah, math. It's they a all can contribute. And this is good. It's going to boost the self esteem of the student, which is going to make him like more uh, be engaged. And also, like you said, the Micheline and Michelle and like all of us it's gonna change the relationship to the mistake, which is very important because, you know, in math, the, the first mathematician, they, they, they used to make mistake, you know, it was basically, it, essay error, you know, when they used to do their theories and stuff, they didn't get it right the first time. So now, but because now we have the knowledge, we always expect the right answer, but there is no right answer here. It's just express yourself, it's less, um intimated intimidating <laughs> intimidating <laughs> yes yeah. but who who between us between all of the ones here doesn't make a mistake also so yeah it's just we had more practice than them to overcome those mistakes that's all but sometimes uh, the intention i always another activity i used to do in my class if you find any of the mistakes, you could leave five minutes earlier or something like that. So they're always on looking for me making mistake. And I always like so leave one or two intentionally and they catch it and they're super happy mm -hmm. that they caught me making a mistake. Oh my God, the teacher making a mistake. It's the end of the world. But this is just to keep there sometimes just other tricks to keep them going and focused because they want to catch you make a mistake so bad sometimes <laughs> that they keep like, their their focus is on for the whole hour and a half or three hours or whatever you know yes. but there's an it's incentive good. right it's good yeah. and it, it it makes the group like more like you know we belong in a group too you know because you're taking Community time to make perfect. activities like with the group and i don't know i don't think it takes a lot of time to do it in a class you know those kind of i think the discussion with the student can be done in like 15 20 minutes depending on our intention but I, I think it brings the group together, you know, and they, they, they we, like Micheline said, we humanize the, the, Math. the mathematics. Yeah. Um, so just to continue with this, like, of course, uh, like we all agreed, it's a good problem and, and it's because it stimulates. And again, we go back always to the mathematical intervention framework. And if you go through the list, you'll notice that, yes, it is this kind of, uh, these kind of experiences that we live in class with them, even to have a conversation, they're open enough that we could have everyone participate. It's all inclusive. Uh, there's many right answers. Notice what Rita said at the beginning, there's no wrong answer and truly there's no wrong answer. These are questions that are designed with the intention that everyone can participate and everyone can give an answer that makes sense of course if they like they give you a cone and they say well this is a 2d shape you could like you could adjust it say well the 2d shape if i look at it from the bottom maybe or from the but, side but not necessarily but they're not so wrong by saying it's a 2d shape because it's on a plan say sur un plan de dimension yeah. so it's a 3d shape um drawn Flatted on a paper <laughs> on a paper on a 2d shape and for student this is hard to understand too in geometry, you know, the, the difference between a 3D shape in real life and on a paper, you know, for some, they don't see the depth in, uh, did I say it right? La profondeur? Yeah. They don't yeah. see it. Yeah. Spatial, spatial, uh, spatial, spatial concept. Uh, so again, can we say that they're wrong? It, it's not, into, it's, it's not, wrong, not a 2D shape, a, but yeah. it's, it's a 3D shape uh, dessiné on a yeah. plan that is in 2D. So this can lead to a conception for the student, for some student, I guess. So 
So again, this is this is all kind of what we're giving you is like just giving you ideas, teaching strategies to create that experience, to create those conversations, to create, to go in a deeper meaning, connect what you're teaching as a, as a theoretical theory to something that they know and they don't have actually usually access to because they don't make connection. So you're just facilitating the connection of what they know, naturally know, to what the concept you're trying to bring into light so and that is actually a super interesting way of engaging them because now they feel they understand and if they understand then they'll stick around now <laughs> we bring into <laughs> technically the second step so let's share and reflect and this one we're looking at it from a teacher's perspective say how did you or, or a student's perspective whatever role you want to play at this moment is up to you um, and if we ask you, how did you experience these two activities? Did you like it? Didn't you like it? Which one you preferred? Would you use it, not use it? Would you do it differently? I was going <laughs> to say, I'm listening because I feel like the students, I'm not a math teacher. English is my specialty. So, um, yeah, I'm looking at all of those things and going, oh, I'm so glad I'm not doing math anymore. <laughs> yeah, oh, but you, you can still give your opinion about that. Well, yeah, no, I mean, I just go in late, but when when I hear about things being more hands-on, I think that would have been amazing for me. I would have understood so much more. I am so visual, like, don't tell me a movie time, you know, I need to see it so and I need to do it so this would have been amazing to have a lot of experience you know and hands-on activities that really reflect what math was all about thank yeah you. yeah thank you and uh, uh, Laura you going through you going through the both activities do you have a preference do you like both would you see yourself doing both it's just I teach math Five. <laughs> yes. So I'm, oh, yeah. I'm looking at these activities. I'm like, they're great. I, I would I would have to figure out how to apply higher math to it. And you know what I mean? Like I would I, I could I could see them working. I just I couldn't talk about like that that last topic, you know what I mean? Where yeah. you just have yeah. the different shapes and you're comparing because I don't see how that would apply to what we're doing. So I can see the benefit of it. I'm just trying to figure out how I could use it. Is yeah. it because of uh, the like yeah. uh, you have to plan yeah. it before, or is it? Uh... It's just it's just the level. It's just the concepts we're dealing with. Okay. Yeah, but but don't forget, Laura. We had picked like you notice volume and solids. Like we picked yeah. like a secondary three level math because I mean that could be like just to to generalize again the the level of math. But for a sec five level of math, there is a lot, there's other videos that will tackle yeah. those topics, but I'm talking more about the strategy, not necessarily like the video. I, I like, no, no, I like both strategies. They both, I, I'm just trying yeah. to figure out yeah. that that's what's going on in my mind. How can I apply this to coming up with yeah. a topic for my class? Yeah. Which is but normal, I, you know? It, yeah. it's oh, very no, normal because it, it's something new and now like you have to like uh think it, i would i i go exactly in the same process like okay it's very nice but how am i gonna how can i use it how can i use it in my classroom yeah. what changes do i do i have to make to make it work you know so it's yeah. like it's yeah it's the natural. second one the, well just the example we use the second one i i can't quite put my finger on it yet how the first one we came up with all these volumes and it's like these are things I can talk about even if they've already learned it because of everything involved the second one has there's just less involved right it's yeah. maybe the choice of the problem here that you don't oh, oh no 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 for sure for sure yeah I just haven't come up there is with... uh, many other uh, kinds that were nice but like we chose this one, but uh... again, we were aiming at uh, <laughs> we're making a general like 
kind of a topic, but you'll see for the SEC five, there's a lot more choices, not a lot more choices, there's different choices, but of course the videos and the activities are related to the topic, the selected topic. So let's say you want to look at functions. There's other yeah. kind of videos for functions. There's other kind of, um, other kind of uh, images where you, yes. which one belongs or not, where you'll have step function, direct function and uh, other functions and say, giving them a situation which one would belong or which one would answer or what's the difference between you know there's other way that is more let's say more involved topics like more yeah. advanced topics that could be actually stimulating conversation too because we all know when you get to sec five it's really more on the mechanic how to solve but really do they really know what it means again that's that's another story and and especially when like i remember like uh, just between a sec five, like the sec four math, SN and the physics or the chemistry, especially physics, because I teach physics. And when I would talk about sounds and, and just showing them those curves, like, or the motion curves, like, you know, uh, the car going forwards, uh, accelerating, slowing down, you know, when we're talking about those kind of curves and, and say, these are functions and what's happening. And they're looking at you like, no, no, this is physics and this is math. They don't go together. And I'm like, no, <laughs> they go together. Math drives physics. And they're looking at me it's like, what are you talking about? And I give them a formula. I say, isolate A, acceleration from the world. They're looking at you like, what are you talking about? This is A, acceleration. It's not a very, it's not a math. And I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> and then you, you have to go back and show them yeah. the math and, you know, but that's that's common for those grades because we're looking more on mechanic because the problems are a bit more involved, right? And the lower level is more like we're looking at more like concept. Do you understand exactly. fractions? You know? Yeah. So yes, yeah. these kind of experiences can be used differently, you know? And you're right, probably one would be more like uh, show me you understood versus the other one is like, let's discover, <laughs> you know? And and there's no right or wrong, it's just creating those moments of like. Let's let's shock the system by taking a moment to think differently. That's all, because adaptation and common sense that goes from one to five, anyways. But uh, we need to work on those. But where do you like? You just Google act yes. to find them. You just Google like. Oh act wait, wait yes. There's you many, Google many, many number talks. Is that is that how you find these yes. things? Well, wait, Laura, we have a whole list for you after oh, that. We're going right. to get, we gonna get to give you all these wonderful little gifts after, you know, but we wanted you to, to, to kind of live through them as, as a teacher, because sometimes when you live through it, then you could see how you could kind of implement it. But in terms of like resources, we kind of have tons for you. Just, yes. just give us we, a moment. We did put a lot, but uh, if... You need more. <laughs> we have uh, more. You can you can always, like you said, you search on Google. Like Tree Act Math is something very popular, so you're gonna have you're gonna find many 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 videos. The one that the resources that we did put in the presentation are all in English, but you can find many in French too. Uh, same for the number talk. Uh, yeah. Then you have other kinds of number talks. Like the one that we chose was which one doesn't belong, but you have other kinds like a dot problem yeah. uh, strategies, you know, for like understanding the concept of multiplication. This is good for students who are like in the um, um, FBC. FBC? Yeah, CCBE. CCBE. That's the so, sec one two, right? CCBE. Yes, yeah. exactly. I, I sec one two. Uh, you have yeah. like any many different kind of problem depending on which level you target. But any research on the internet, you're gonna find many many uh, yeah. resources. But we, but we did put really a lot. Oh yeah, no, no, no. I just I I have to look into it more. You, it's yeah, just yeah. been. It's well, good that you say that. Inspire you. That's the whole idea. Is just to inspire you and to yeah, fill in your absolutely. toolbox a bit more. I do feel inspired. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And and does you, uh, anyone uh, want to say? Uh, uh, sorry, yes, Michelle. 
uh, how, how we can use them while well, being individual, multi-level, multi-subject classroom. Uh, it's kind of hard to do teacher directed because some are like, I don't want to have anything to do with math because I don't need to do it. So, but what I was doing in the process of all this is I was thinking maybe I could use it when I'm prepping my students for their evaluation for their exams, especially the second one, um, because like there's no right or wrong answer. And so, you know, this is, this is where I need you to correct me because in the first part you know it's knowledge based and it's like it has to be accurate and you have to have you know your two plus two equals four so that's the first part of the exam the second part is a complex task and i think we're marking in the sense that you know you don't have to have the right answer as long as you're choosing the appropriate process and there's room for error and mistakes so i think i could see uh, applying that example to sort of say like uh, you know you guys are divergent thinkers you have different ways of solving things so even though you might have some math tools or hopefully you've gained math tools by the time you're doing an exam that you can sort of try and think out of the box and use different ways to solve the problem that may not be the suggested solution in the end answer key but could arrive pretty close at what you're doing so this is where i think i could probably apply this particular strategy i, I love it I, this I, is I, the I flexibility yeah. like uh, you said you're, you're thinking about developing the flexibility of the student which is uh, in the reference in the mathematical yeah. uh, framework is something that is very important to have a deeper understanding of things yeah but but just to add to that, I love that point that you brought up where we have a program that's based on competency, even though we're, we're teaching knowledge. So the competency I know for a math teacher, and this is funny because we had this conversation yesterday, for, it's sometimes difficult for a math teacher to recognize that you could still do well in a problem with the wrong answer. You know, it's just counterintuitive. Math, you have to get the right answer to get the right problem. But because it's a competency base, you could have the competency and not necessarily have the right answer and you still could do super, super well. So this is, these kind of exercises, the fact that you're removing also the challenge of writing. Sometimes people have difficulty writing, having these conversation out loud, I would go about it this way. When you and Laura had different way of solving, just the fact that you're verbalizing, you're organizing it in your mind, you're organizing the information in your mind because you have to share that with somebody. And that is the competency when we're talking about show me uh, your, your thinking process in an exam. This is a competency that you're developing orally. And then if you want to go a step further, while the student's talking, you're taking note and then you're showing them what they just said to you in a more organized fashion. So you just showed the, the you're just developed with the student a strategy on how they communicate their thought. And this is exactly what they're being evaluated on if we're looking at a competency perspective. And I, I find that like when you're teaching math, like the first part of it, and it's all like, like I've been teaching them like, okay, do the question, verify the answer. Cause you know, always verify cause they, they're, they're in the habit of do all the questions and then go back and check. And then, you know, of course they've made mistakes and they've patterned it and they've learned it seven times the wrong way. So you got to un undo that. So I, I hammer that in that they have to verify all the time. And then all of a sudden they're transitioning into the complex task and it's not necessarily that specific detailed way of doing things. There's like, there, we're asking them to be more like, you know, to be able to take all kinds of information, put it in and then solve the problem. And so this way, that example of, you know, the number talk allows them to, tr I would see a form of transition into from doing the specific, you know, here's the formula, get the answer to, okay, now you need to, to, to be more complex about your solution. So I see that as a good transition for that. So I'm hoping that would be something I can work into when I do prep tests for them and things like that, that would be helpful to them I'm hoping yeah so that's where I see that thank you thank you so what I'm trying to say is these both uh, strategies depending on, on the intention being that reviewing or prior to a concept or even practicing strategies or like competency that they're evaluating on like let's say you have a student have difficulty in showing their work you could practice with that say okay let's go through math react and now let's see you're thinking you talk, talk i'm writing down taking down and this is what you told me look how is it written i would like you next time maybe to to tape it 
to tape it on a, on a recorder and then translate it into steps for me because this is what I want to see. I want to see your mind. I don't want to see the math part. I want to see how you're going about thinking it. And this is competencies like, and of course, common sense and sense making. The more you do this, the more you, you will get better at it, really. So I think um, that's what I was trying to say before. <laughs> So, so this is the point that I love. Laura said it before. So, well, so what? Now I, we, we experienced something, we saw their benefit, but so what? How is that really going to apply to me? Right? So I captured that. <laughs> we captured that. <laughs> so, so here uh, we planned uh, an activity for you to give you time, you know, to uh, think about uh, how you can try one in your, uh, in your class. So here the the idea for you is to plan the math lesson uh, it doesn't have to be complicated it can be very like as simple as you want it to be um, the idea is, is just to think about what can i try differently in my practice so um so i i can make the the the, the student experience uh something uh so we chose a sub subject but um we can think about another one, but we decided to go with the scale. So the situation is that you notice that some of your students are struggling in algebra and geometry with the concept of scale. So you decided to make it more concrete for them. So the task here is that uh, you have to decide to teach your student about scale, uh, choose a teaching method and plan a 20 minute lesson for your student it can be less you know it doesn't have to be more than 20 so we said 20 minutes because usually when it's more than 20 it's like too much for the student so it can be an activity that is 10 or 15 or 20 minutes but it's um it doesn't have to be like the whole complicated that's what we meant by the 20 minutes the whole idea here is really we wanted you to kind of live through it. We talked about it. It's just now to to actually take it a step further and say, okay, if you have to plan for a challenge you have in class, well, we know scale is always a problem. Proportions and stuff seems to be always an issue over here. Um, it's just to plan it to plan it in such like to think through it like how would I apply it in my in my class, right? So to plan a lesson. Uh, notice here, um, if you click, uh, click on the document, please, uh, Rita. So just, just to go over this, what we wanted to give you here is just a heads up. So um, uh, we, we picked a model of planning model, which we call the GAID model, which is goal, action, demonstrate learning and environment. This is, again, it's just, it's just a suggestion. I know we all plan differently our classroom, and it's not to say one is better than another. We just wanted to give you a template of what we thought would be an interesting way of planning those kind of activities. So notice over here, we said we took the examples that we did for, for, for volume, like the first, uh, the three acts, the math three, uh, three times and three acts, and we, we wanted to show you how we planned it. So we said, for example, for the first one is the goal. What do I want? Uh, what do you want students to be able to do, know, uh, or understand by the end of this lesson? Is the I can statement. If you if you have any I can statement, so I want them specifically to I to understand the concept of volume. Let's say, for example, volume of salt depends on the area of the base and the height. Uh, the interrelation between volume area and uh, and base and solid heights. So for example, just to talk about the relationship. So if I give them this kind of video or this kind of images, will I be able to stimulate? This is my intention. I want them the conversation to be able to kind of go around these topics. This is what I'm aiming for. Now, if I take a look on action, which is the A, how are you going to break down the substance of the lesson to help students reach the goal? So here, this is like the, 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 the bite, okay? How am I gonna get my students to get them to know the concept of volume? Well, I'm gonna try maybe math in three acts, get a video about like filling up cups and say, okay. So from a concrete example, like sharing a drink to measuring quantity, which using formula. So I would like to use math discussion and peer teaching here for them to get the concept of volume, but more in a deeper understanding. So now, D, how would I know that they actually got it? 
that's the whole idea. It's like, yeah, I'm giving them all these things, these tools, but how would I measure that they actually got it? Is I'm going to listen and see if they're using the right words or uh, the way they're explaining their strategy. This is my way. If they, they're able to use words to explain strategies on how they their, their thinking process, share and compare their solution, complete the task. I want them to finish the task, you know? For me, is is important to 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 see that they're able to communicate what they're thinking, and the last one in term of a physical environment, what can I do to facilitate that kind of exercise? Okay, well, I need a computer, paper, pencil, whatever it is. Do I want them all to be on their devices? Do I want them to all be in a laboratory? Do I want them to physically do it? You know, so this is this is where the planning part becomes interesting. Okay, so um. That being said, do we have any questions? Is this something you would love to, you would like to kind of do? Or would you want to do on your own? Well, now I'm going to suggest um, something. So we prepared the slide. So you, you we have many slides. Um, so maybe if you want to do it individually, well, we can like take uh, 15 minutes so each one of you think about one concept you would like more uh, to experiment in your classroom um, write down all of your ideas remember there is no good or bad ideas because we know that it's uh, it's not so easy you know to be creative like this on the, the on the spot on the spot so you fill one and then after you take 15 minutes, we take a break of 15 minutes, and then when we come back all together, uh, we can talk about your other ideas. Because I think probably all of you, you already do some stuff in your classroom that are also based probably ex ex uh, experience, experience. experience yeah. stuff. So it's gonna be a good moment to share also the way of you do things. Yeah. Um, I, I love what Rita said. It's, it's, it doesn't have to be, by the way, what we, we, we showed you. It doesn't have to be number line and math in three acts because I know you don't know it. So I'm not expecting you to just to put it there. But this could be something you could look at. You could add it as maybe a strategy or something you could put. It doesn't mean necessarily that's what you use. But do you right away in class as it is now, do you ever use experiential math? Do you, if you have like students who have a difficulty, how do you make it concrete for them? And if you didn't, you never use concrete way of teaching in math, is there maybe something you'll be interested in, you know, of, of discovering more or like math labs, in other words? Is that okay to, to give you a bit of time to think it through? Like just maybe, yeah, and then so we'll... Uh, so just so I don't put 15 minutes into being totally off the off the boat here. Um, so if I was going to like scale, you refer to number line. And if I use uh, concrete actions of money uh, being in debt versus uh, that, that's what I would be filling yeah. in with the, the, the GAD or the that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Like if you have somebody who has difficulty with, uh, I don't know, um, difficulty, like you say, with the, the, the positive negative numbers, how would you show them? Okay, I would use uh, like, you know, the money system. Right. Yeah. So that's a, that's an experience. That's an experience that you use a hands on a more concrete way for the students to understand, like this is positive numbers. This is a negative. Number. Am I in the red? Am I in the blue type of thing or whatever? So that's another form of experience you know, experience teaching, right? Uh, for- And of course, like the A, the, the, the A, it's like here we chose math in three acts, but it's, you know, we had the time to look at it. So if you want to like, uh, here maybe this part, like it's an idea, but it doesn't have to be like uh, uh, perfect. It doesn't mean like you have to do the material. It's just like, the idea it would be nice to have something like that uh maybe we can like it gives ideas to the, as yeah it's just like a, for example michelle uh, for your for your thing which you're saying you could say like for example going to the bank or a store like an in-class store or 
or you know an article uh, like okay you want to you have five hundred dollars and you need to buy clothes but you have these payments or maybe like you know making a budget uh, you know stuff like that these are all experiential you know situation i don't do it together so we can bounce ideas off yeah. each other and okay, i don't mind do doing that. i don't mind doing that either uh the, yeah order of operation i know it's yeah. a big one yeah. or like let's start actually let's do it together in term like let's let's see where like just out of curiosity i want to know like michelle laura and jessica what is a topic that seems to get on your nerves that it always keeps to be recurring let's say at what you know in the level you're teaching I know personally, I say order of operation because yes, isolating a variable, I, I like I pull my hair every time with that, yes. but that's yeah. a personal thing to it. No, know? no, I, I, I have that problem <laughs> a lot too. Like if if I said word problems, that's too big, eh? <laughs> no, it's it's not. Not. And they just and they don't know where to start. Even though I'm like, like the other day, I'm like look you have this even if you don't know what to do with it what information can you get from what you have yeah start with that yeah but they're just like they get overwhelmed very easily very oh fun. yeah mm -hmm. well jessica here you can join us too if you so order operation for sure um i i lose my mind a little bit every time students say x is one <laughs> I was like, there's a one in front of the X, does it mean X is one? <laughs> <laughs> but you know, there, I used to have a student who just kind of in the middle of the class did declare X is one and it's stuck in everybody's mind, drove mm -hmm. me nuts. But uh, I was, was, was hearing in between things and I do have these because I want to do experiential math. I wanted to make it more real life so we can relate it better, visualize it better, have more motivated to learn it. But individualize is extremely hard. Uh, but I have those, I don't know if you guys can see from my uh, camera. I have pictures of, I don't know, jeans, coffee, chicken wings, pizza, jackets and I try to and uh, actually I have a discount like you're adding tips if I have a discount and uh, things like that and set up like a shopping scenario you buy two of this five of that you get a discount like in percentage or in a special like a just two dollar off whichever and get the student to kind of play cashier to say uh, how would you add out which one will make sense right if you have two of this and then a discount would you apply the discount to the bill or just one like what what would be the scenario and hopefully have that order operation actually start to make more sense that we time each other because there's no need to add everything up and do it like that and if so I use that to hopefully get them to sync and That's they can nice. set their prices. They can actually just uh, erasable so they can set the price, hide it and uh, do the calculation. And and it also works for um, isolating variable. I love that. I love that. One thing I've done, and this actually was a, like a, the moment, like uh, like we say in the moment, was you know when we play cards you know the whole idea of understanding variables what is a variable okay mm -hmm. i did i took a card a set of cards of 52 and i removed um, well no i didn't move anything i just removed all the jokers and i added two jokers so uh, we play cards you know and you know when we like when you have students playing cards and you have a set, you know, like you have two, three, four, five, and then they have a joker, and then seven, eight, nine, right? And then I tell them, okay, you, what is your joker, for example? And the joker, they say, well, it's the value eight. And then I ask this, the student next to them, what is the value of your joker? Well, it's a, it's a jack. And I ask the other student, what's your, the value of your joker? Well, it's a two. Hmm. It's the same joker, but this joker has the value of eight, jack, and a two. How could that be? And I tell them, okay, now write it down. 
then you get five plus six plus seven plus joker. They write joker plus eight plus nine. And I say, how come your joker here, what value does it have? Well, it has the value eight. That means the joker, if I compare, let's say Laura's joker to Michelle's joker to Jessica's joker, each time it has a different value. And they're like, I go, but how come? Well, it could take any value it wants. Oh, really? So now let's change joker by an X. Oh, that's what it is? That's what I get. It's the whole idea because they know how to play card games. And it's to make them understand that the X, the concept of the X, or it could be a Y or a table, whatever, it's a joker in a pack. And it changes value depending on where you put it. So that to me, like in my class, that kind of, for some people made like a, you know, kind of got them to understand what is a variable. Because before, yeah, you could put X and suddenly they, they get like, I don't know what to do. Is it the next? Or they were always taught to put the Y on the left and the X on the right. Or the X on the left, <laughs> Y on the right. And if you give them an equation, you say reset it and they don't know what to do with it. They're like suddenly mm -hmm. like, I don't know how to get it in this format, right? Like from general to. So the Joker game kind of helped me for them. Well, in my case, it helped a couple of students to figure out that Joker, all it means, a variable, it's the Joker in a set. I know it's a bit far-fetched, but I had to kind of be a bit creative on that one, <laughs> you know? So, well, I don't know if that inspires. On that note, Matt, Michelin, in, in uh, 21, isn't the ace either a one or an 11? And you get to pick which one it is? Yes, but you which have to identify it, it at the beginning. You have to identify it at the beginning. And you're right. You're absolutely right. So within the same thoughts, then I start getting fancier, you know? Yeah, that's that's the whole thing. And sometimes I change, like I would give them a card game and instead of having a joker, I put like a picture of a table and I say, okay, what is the table, the value of a table? And they're like, I don't know. And I'm like, it's the joker. I just wanted to put it in a table form. Mm -hmm. and, and just to throw these things because they associate one variable all the time to the unknown. And the thing is, it's not true. Sometimes I might just want another variable to be the unknown, but they're so rigid because, again, they were taught a certain way and it's been just eroded, like ingrained in their mind that to solve, it has to be Y equal to, which is, yeah. I agree. I'm, you know? I'm also thinking, um, we were doing problems the other day and instead of Y and X, they did, uh, I think it was W of T because we were looking for weight. And then instead of using X, we use T for time. And like that threw them off because mm -hmm. it's like, I don't know what to do with it because it's not Y and X. That's right. That's right. So, so, so that's why, that's why like sometimes through games, I, I, I found like that through something they're not expecting, like playing a game. And I'm not saying that's the way to go, but I'm saying in my set, I had like three, four students that I say, okay, let's play a card game. And they're like, what do you mean? We're math. I'm like, yeah, but let's see. <laughs> let's have fun with this. And I would throw in those like switches. And it's just to, to make them feel uncomfortable, to make them feel like, listen, in life, we have to be flexible. You really have to understand what you're doing, you know? And after a few exposure to that, suddenly like it clicked in their head, you know? Now, if, if, I mean, these are ideas, you know, uh, and in, in Michelle is context in, in term of like, let's say, for example, I love what Jessica said, for, by the way, with these, like, just for individualized with these cards, you could almost put them like in envelopes, you know, and say, okay, you do from envelope from one to 10, and you'll have different setup, one with like discounts, one with the, with taxes, one could be co combination discount and taxes, you know, and that could be an order of operation, you know, depends on how comfortable they are, right? Now, Personally, for D, uh, I I love the idea too of uh, like uh, playing it. The like the someone plays the cashier and someone plays the and you know you you have to steal money. <laughs> <It's> not, <laughs> so you have to be careful not to you know to be a make sure that the person gave you back your money correctly. You know, 
that yeah. she didn't take too much and uh, it's uh, yeah. very interesting because they they something they they all um experienced in their uh, in their life I but but like Rishak said the first job is cashier and just to be honest with all of you how many of you've been to a store where you buy stuff and whatever on the cash is written and then you give them a different number you know, and suddenly they don't know what to do because it's not written that I have to give you this much back, you know? So anyway. When you so cashier, this, like you calculate the um, everything. à l'envers, backwards. Yeah. Huh? So it's, uh, it's not the way we teach it in math. No, no. A another thing, I think now you made me think for the SEC 5 specially that I, I, I thought would be a great idea is to get them to do the manual work. I know in physics, what I did once is, you know, the ticker tack, they, they do like an experiment and they have to tabulate it in a table. And then from there, they have to draw their function, you know, and then once they get their function, then they could deduce what was happening. This, what I would have done in math, I would have given them tables or maybe have like a table that would give them a function and now say okay find me um find me or or give them a situation and say what function would apply to this if we're looking at buying stuff if i'm buying if i'm always paying tax so the only thing that changes is the price of the the clothing right so find me an equation with that you you, you want to always be prepared to tip what would your equation be for tipping, right? Where would you look on a recipe, on, on, a, on a bill to kind of guide you on how much you have to tip, like the percentages of taxes, right? So that could be an indicator. Like stuff like that, you know, I find, I find uh, sometimes it's just, you know, to inspire them, like to give them like real life trick that you could bring in into the classroom, you know? Um, I know something for me, what, I, what I've done for students and not recently, but I've done it quite a bit is uh, I've created like a form of uh, monopoly money and uh, ex exactly the students going into work in the small stores or restaurants, they don't know how to make cash. And once the cash register breaks, they're, they're really lost. They can't do the math themselves. So uh, I land up uh, practicing with them. And at first they think it's kind of like a uh, babyish or immature but eventually when they start realizing the different strategy to count the money back to people not putting a 20 in the cash register leaving it on top all those basic skills so i find that the little monopoly game with the money and actually having them do it concretely forces them to really uh, learn it and, and practice it so that's one of the things i do for that and that helps with um the minus and debt negative and you know well that stuff the other thing uh, when you're talking about card games michelin uh i it, it made me uh, think of uh, the game five crowns i don't know if anybody's heard of it but i think that changes the variable every time you change the wild one so that would really have them un trying to understand how to use a variable so and i'm thinking that maybe i can do that on friday afternoons when they're not too excited about being here and make it into like <laughs> thing so yeah so i think that would be good i've tried crib that doesn't work <laughs> crib is just for my, my group that's a little bit too difficult for them but uh yeah but five crowns i think it's like a rummy a form of rummy only um a little bit more uh yeah so and, and and just to tell you know michelle a game i used only also for my students who have difficulty in sense making you know i don't know if you know the the game called the war like when you mm -hmm. have, you take the set of, set of the, the 52 card, you separate it into two. And yeah. what they have to do is like my number against your number and which one is the yeah. bigger one. That, oh my God, like you think it's like a, a five-year-old can do it. I was so surprised to say, <laughs> oh boy, you know, and, and it's okay. It's okay. I'm super happy when I catch it because if I yeah. could catch it, I could solve it. But if I don't catch it, it creates so many problems, you know, and it's sometimes honestly is those small problems that kind of combine becomes a bigger issue. So uh, actually, actually, just to go back on the order of operation, the more I like kind of reflect on it, the more I recognize they don't even know the 
basic operations. And that is the issue too. They know how to do the operation mechanically, but they don't understand. What I'm adding is I'm increasing. What that means means I'm like, my number is getting bigger. So I think if we're teaching, like try to, to teach order of operation without number. Let's see how that goes. It's going to be a nightmare, honestly. But if you take, you know, it, it's just a thought. I mean, I, I never did it, to be honest with you. I never did it. But try to remove the numbers from order of operation just in terms of relation. Would I get bigger or smaller? And see where their thinking goes with that, you know? So anyway, uh, these are Michelle, all. I, I just had an idea. Sorry, because we're talking. Okay. One of the things my, oh, sec five. Okay, and I have a student say, well, how come you can just add a two to one side? I'm not adding a two to one side. I'm adding a two to both sides. It's still equal. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, like, they're just like, you can't just, and I'm like, yeah, because I added it. So I was just thinking, this idea popped into my head. What if we had like, not numbers, but uh, like pennies or, 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 or whatever. Thanks things and you have the same number on both sides okay and i don't know if i add two to one side i can in order for them still to be equal i can count them well i have to add two to the other side mm -hmm. if i divide one side by two so if i take away half if i still want them to be equal you can count i just have to take away half on the other side i don't know it, that thought just occurred to me I love it. I love it. And actually, just to go over what you just said, there's actually one of the video in Math 3 Acts about a scale. Actually, there is a whole activity about scale. And when you're talking like that in my head, it was like, I remember seeing it. And it's like having literally a scale, like those old scales. Oh, okay, that, and yeah, say, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The, the, like the balance, say, okay. you mean? Yeah, the balance. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, the balance, the old balance and visually say, okay, I have five on each. Now what happened if I move one? Look, it's not balanced, not equivalent. So now I have to move one. So minus one here, minus one here. I removed half. Oh, look at that. I minus this much, minus this. I divided them in two groups. Look at that. It's the same, but visually combining it with it so if this is if you have it but there is also actually virtuals like balances that we can use like like you know online and stuff for for that too so yeah i think i think we have to go back to literally really basic basic concept because you're right the adding thing when we're moving things around they don't get it that you already do it that's why when you're going over the equal sign like I know this this rings in my head so many times when I, I move the two from one side to the other and sometimes they forget to sub like you know mm -hmm. to to change the time. They forget <laughs> to inverse. And they say, Well, I just moved it. I say, No, it doesn't, it's not moving. It's not moving. No, I removed moved. it from this side, so I had to remove it from this side. Yeah. Thank and how many, teachers, <laughs> how many teachers skip that step when they're teaching this? It's it's I know. Um, I think it's because it's very intuitive uh, to do it uh, this way. I know. But uh, there is um, an application that is very nice to to uh, to to use with the student. When you, I don't know if you heard about it. It's called the grass pebble mat, and it's yeah. uh, it's very fun. You know, it's they just they very. do it, and they 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 don't have like to write down their. Um, uh, not yeah, the not. steps the steps yeah, they don't the, have the to step. write them it does them for them but it's basically the student takes it from one side brings it to the other and he sees what happens so and it's mm -hmm. like more of a natural way to learn how we isolate the algebra it's an uh, inductive way yeah uh i don't uh, i don't know if yeah. anybody had tried it but if we uh, we could do a workshop on it i've done it in the past uh with the uh, with louise Hua, but it's it's an amazing i put the link in, in the chat and what i would like you to bring your attention on that link if you go to the bottom bottom there's games and these games are They're amazing amazing. <laughs> amazing because they were actually uh they were taught in an adult setup and the person who taught them, and another teacher that I know taught them in the adult, he goes, Michelin, they're the best because the, the, he goes, uh, he, the, the student developed fluidity and intuition just by playing these games because what they do is they show you the steps 
but yes. the game is done. You have, I'll show you, I'll share my screen. I hope my um, computer But you have uh, Michelle who has something to yeah, add. Yeah, sorry, go, go Michelle. Okay, just really quickly, uh, wow, Laura, secondary five, and they're having trouble with that. So I don't feel so bad. But just that little comment. I, yes, just I, one I, one <laughs> my TS, the best yeah. ones. And I, and I lived the problem too with the fractions. They get to secondary three, they could do the algebra, but they can't do the fractions. So they have the answers they're wrong. So they're scared but, of them. Yeah, yeah. And so what I, they always want to convert it to decimals. The high school teachers here have taught them to convert it to decimals. And then they realize that they have trouble because they need to have the answer differently. But I, with that, with your problem, though, what I've done with my group is always when I start seeing that, it's like they learn a mental calcul in secondary one and two. And then when they get to three and four, they've kind of forgotten that they're doing a mental calcul and that there's, so I bring them back to the equal sign, equal sign. And I use the idea of a balance, a teeter talk and and I use that idea of like look you if you if you're just doing it on one side this is what your this is what your solution is giving you it's giving this uh it's not balanced and that's why the equal sign is so important and they kind of forget that they always so that's how I I bring it back to that with them to show them that but I don't know if that can help you at all but yeah so I do get what you're saying but that's like yes. wow that's secondary five that's taking it back so thank mm -hmm. you it's uh, very uh, interesting because, uh, you know, just the other day I was uh, looking uh, uh, at the solution with uh, another another teacher, a student uh, did something. Uh, there was no variable in the equation, but she was in uh, secondary like uh, four, I think. And she's so used to have variables, you know, so she did add one. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. they come out of nowhere. It came out of nowhere, you know, yeah. and that was like, oh, you know, and here, like, yeah, we, we, she, like, I was like, okay, it's because she's so used to have variables that she couldn't understand that there is no, um, it was just a simple question that she has just to um, remplacer, she just had to, like, uh, replace the, the, the variables by numbers. It was a regular formula, math, uh, formula of, uh, <clears throat> geometry and she there was no variables at the end so she was like oh it's missing something so she added one <laughs> so I, I, I have a similar experience Rita when we're doing quadratic functions okay and they you know in order to solve for x in a quadratic yeah. function it you in order to use the quadratic formula it has to be equal to zero yeah so you'll tell them like y is equal to two you need to solve for x, but in their minds, well, the equation needs to be equal to zero. So they don't even put the two, they just solve for y is equal to zero. Yeah. Oh. That's, yeah. 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 It's yeah. a mathemagie. <laughs> no, no, but it's just like, well, it has to be equal to zero. So I know to solve equal to zero, let me just make it equal to zero and solve. They, they do yeah. this like all the time. Yeah, yeah. they escape the problem. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's maybe it's a, new, it's a new, it's a new math we just don't, we're not aware of. You just, uh, you know, <laughs> it's magic. exactly, magic. magical math, you know, magical math. Yes. So, but it's because yeah. they're so, it, it's inbred that, okay, it has to be equal to zero to solve, but they don't think, well, make it equal to two and move the two to the other side. It's just, no, it's ingrained. It's equal to zero. I, this is what I know how to do. This is what I'm doing, even though it might not make sense. You're getting what I know. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, this is opportunities when, you know, when you kind of put it in a game format, you know, you're kind of disconnecting them from where they're anchored with to say, look, there's a point for this. And now let's bring back what you know after and let's see, you know? Yes. And th this, th is a, this is a good problem, uh, Laura, to do like with your, your, uh, if you have a lot of students in, in the same uh, Class. course, mm -hmm. well, you can always take the problem and make it like a number talk, like a discussion, you know? Here's the problem, and now let's discuss how we're going to do it. We're not going to do it, but just asking them how we are going to do it. But for them, it's the one who and always fine. puts a zero. Well, he's going to, I yeah. hope so, he's going to get it that, you know, I cannot do that when I want to know uh, yeah. uh, equal to, you know, when it's equal to, 
too. I'm sorry, I'm searching for my words. It's so yeah. much, so hard for me. <laughs> You're doing great, Rita. You're doing great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> But you know what, to, to combine with that thought as a number talk, or you could say, okay, everybody, let's do this. Everybody, I would like you to work uh, to, to, to this on your paper, and then share it with your neighbor, correct each yeah. other, and then let's discuss it as a group. Because it is a problem that, that if you don't address it, even the ones that they know how to do it, I don't know if they know it because they just know how to solve or is it because they really understand? And maybe the ones that know how to do it, maybe they'll be better uh, to explain it to the rest mm -hmm. of the group because you obviously tried many, many ways. And sometimes it takes that another way of that student may say like, just do it this way. And they're able to tell them like, you know, to do it a certain way that maybe you didn't see it. You know what I mean? Peer so, teaching, yeah. It does have- uh... Sometimes. But especially at that level, they listen to each other because they're competitive. They want to do well. You know, it's the lower ones. It's the lower, it's the lower grade ones that's that you have to engage them and almost like dance and whistle to them to keep them going. But the, the higher, like the higher levels, they just want to do it and get it right. So the getting it right sometimes has to be challenged, which is actually another, another, you know, type of students, right? Another type of creativity, <laughs> challenging. Explain to me why. Adding the why to everything gets them upset because they don't know sometimes and they're supposed they're to They're not used to that. Them. They're not no, used no. to be to, to doing that. This is how it's done and that's it, that's all. Yeah, just tell me how, you know? That's the first question. Yes, yes. You tell can put how. a problem on the board, they don't, they don't want to figure it out. They want you to tell them how to do it, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, so that brings us to a, a moment. You guys want to go get a cup of coffee. Let's take 10 minutes, if you don't mind. Let's take 10 minutes, cup of coffee, and then come back. And we'll finalize with all the resources and all the stuff that we want to give you, the goody stuff. Uh, and you're going to see, we showed you two methods, but there's a lot more. So more. many more. You know? and, and that and might actually a go-to sometimes when we're stuck in terms of, of uh, we have something to, to show students and we don't know what to do it. So you might think of you know grabbing some of these tools so to come back to 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 what we started off again we we had given the the uh the idea to to create a lesson plan on uh, scale so this is another way of of how we can do it this is uh, how i tried it in my class i did actually many activities I, i'm a very hands-on person right but this one I did with some of the students. What so I, the whole idea, what I used to do is like, I used to give them manipulative. I used to give them two dice, two dice, you know, of different size and say like physically discuss, okay, your observation, which one's bigger, which one's smaller, how do I know, prove it to me, notation, vocabulary, you know, like what does ratio mean? Where do I find it on a, on a, on a, on a scale? Like all of these kind of conversation, we used to go through it and then ask, each student to build a die with a with a ratio in mind like they used to say okay I want it five times bigger so I would write it three to like let's say five to one whatever so they'll build it or uh, they could have play-doh you know through play-doh is easier you know than cutting and paste but I used to leave that open to them if they want to be more artistic go ahead I was more like the type of like no give me play-doh or the cubes you know the cubes um so once they do that they kind of understand what does it mean ratio and after uh, I will, we'll have the discussion, say, okay, you created this ratio of a, of a dice versus the, the initial dice. Explain to me, what did you, how did you do it? How did you think about it? So there'll be conversation and tell me what I did is I took the measurement and I timed it by five. So, you know, that's why it's five times the size here. And, and, and they'll talk about it and then ask them after to build another, another dice with a different ratio, you know? So practice that part. Um, I, I left you another idea over here, but this is more like for, for, for the component of like, you know, the, the, the drafting component, like the three views and stuff. So there's activities there on, on playing with that. So these are, anyways, this is just a suggestion of one way you could teach scale. Another way I taught scale is I got them to measure the classroom and to draw it on an eight by 10 physically, like with tapes and stuff. So I would say, well, how would the wall fit on a piece of paper? They can't, so we have to reduce it. So they had this, this physical thing to, 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 to measure and put together. 
So this is one way of doing scale, especially for the hands-on ones where they were, they were able to, to they, they enjoyed it and they got it. Now, um, based on, on, on the activities that we just did, if we describe experiential math, would you keep the same definition you had at the beginning or would you change it? That's why at the beginning when we said somebody said was hands-on or somebody said was based evidence, all of that. Well, these are all good, but going through the process of, of like trying a full, like a through 360 degree experiential learning, um, it might change the definition. So let's take a look at what the, the theory says. So uh, David Cove, uh, I don't know if you heard about him. He did a lot of research on uh, experiential learning. And he said that learning is a process whereby knowledge is created through the transformation of experience. So here, what it means is that when you experience something, you learn from it, and then you try either to reproduce it or not, depending on what you've experienced. So we're going to keep going and we're going to see how this definition um, uh, does apply to math experience. So just just to go over this slide here, well, if you notice the definition had the word experience and me and Rita had a long conversation about what <laughs> experience means. So even vocabulary sometimes could trigger thoughts, right? When we say experience, I love it. Like how the first, when we think about it, experience first thing is like, oh my God, it has to be hands-on. Oh, it has to be tactile. But it's not necessarily the case. Yeah. When we're talking about experience, it could be just, it's just context, right? You know, experience. It's like kicking your brain, but <laughs> that's all it means. All it means is creating ways to kind of surprise you, to to get you uncomfortable, to creating more neurological links and and networking links, and and it's just surprise. The element of of living something, being either a discussion, being a hands on, being something that impacted you enough that that your mind like creates more links. Yes, and when we kick our brain in the butts, we remember things, we don't forget them because it's something that is- uh, uh, very, Yeah. Mem memorable. <laughs> yes, memorable. So mathematical concept needs to be connected to the real world to give context, allowing for a deeper understanding. So because context gives meaning like, uh, and and this uh, also like uh, we had a big debate uh, Micheline uh, and me on it because uh, what do we mean by context you know is it like le faux context is it, or is it, is it like the yeah. experience like the context in the environment in which I experienced uh, something uh, in mathematics so yeah. it's, it's just a thought yeah, it's just it's just the first word when I saw contest. Oh, the first thing was like these complex tasks. Oh my God, I hate them. They did they're not connected. Like the student reads it and they're like, "What the heck is this?" You know, I don't understand anything, and they get stuck with the context. But this is not what we mean by by here. Here, what we mean by context is like the 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 ex the positive experience that we got us to understand to have a relationship with the math idea that that leaves like uh, a deeper uh, leaves actually a base for us to connect other things too in other words yes and does the context have to be complicated like well now we've seen that it doesn't really have to be that complicated it can be as simple as like one sentence one image one small problem Video. like laura suggested when she's doing the quadratic uh, fun function well it could be just a simple problem but here what the context means is that how am i am i gonna gonna work this with the student so he can understand this and that and that so it's a very different way of seeing the experience in mathematics yeah because i'm thinking sometimes we, yeah, we've all seen those problems where we do ask you know i want to make a hat for my dog you know but who does that like who, who builds a, a hat for a dog you know we buy it. <laughs> we might buy it and you, pay tax and discount on it. 
<laughs> Rita, you make me laugh because some of these questions that they come up with on our exams, which they're like, let's make them applicable. And you're like, who would do this? Yeah. Exactly. Like, like, honestly, you're trying to make it applicable to make it like meaningful, but you're like, nobody would do this. Yeah. Yes. So it, it's, <laughs> it's kind of the irony, you know, in, uh, in math, you know, but uh, we also we also know that it's important, you know, to have the the context for the student so it does make sense for him because we've seen it. Why, like when we are talking about centimeter cube versus millimeters, why would would the student do that? You know, if I go only in theory, he's totally right. He gets the answer by just calculating the volume in centimeter cube. But in reality, that's not how we work. So here the context come and gives like a better understanding of the concept. Yeah. So the good news is with everything that we experience today, it's actually based on theories that it's actually been tested. Like, you know, when we say base evidence is actually based on, on, uh, on a theory uh, that it's called Kolb's model. And just to let you know, David Kolb's, that was um, that was the theory that was actually recently, relatively recently been like published and is being on fire since. It's we're talking about like 1984 or 85. So it's a relatively new theory in, in application. So we'll 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 show you the video to um, get them to explain it a bit better and then we'll Experiential learning theory draws on the work of prominent 20th century thinkers who made experience a central role in their theories of human learning and development. David Kolb synthesized the work of these foundational scholars to develop a holistic model of experiential learning theory. Learning is the process whereby knowledge is created through the transformation of experience. This is ELT in a nutshell. The theory is built on six propositions that are shared by the foundational scholars. Learning outcome is not an endpoint, but simply a resting point of an ongoing learning process. As we learn new ideas, we also modify and dispose of old ones. Effective learners are capable of balancing the opposing modes in the learning cycle. Learning never ends. It encompasses all life stages from childhood to adolescence to middle and old age. When learners and the environment interact, both are changed. We do not simply respond to the environment, but we recreate it to meet our needs. Every field requires unique skills and a special learning process. Learning to develop skills in empathic listening is different than learning skills in engineering. Since its emergence in the early 1970s, there have been over 90,000 experiential learning citations, and ELT has been used to create countless educational courses in multiple fields. Since 2000, ELT research in many fields around the world has more than quadrupled. Experiential learning theory is highly interdisciplinary, addressing learning and educational issues in at least 30 academic disciplines. More and more institutions and educators are experimenting with experiential learning practices beyond higher education. In recent years, K-12 institutions, business organizations, and non-formal organizations have embraced ELT to respond to the learning needs of their clients and constituents. Through recursive cycles of experience, discussion, feedback, and practice and application in real-life context, learners report increased levels of critical thinking abilities and the capacity to apply and connect theoretical knowledge with real-life application. Like Kurt Lewin said, there is nothing so practical as a good theory. And like David Hunt said, there is nothing so theoretical as a good practice. 
ELT continues to be renewed and enriched through the collective experience of those who apply the theory in their practices around the world. As the workplace, marketplace, and global environment continue to evolve, experiential learning theory is designed to respond to the educational needs of the 21st century. Just to, 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 to we wanted to show you the video that this is a, a model that doesn't only apply in an education setup. It, it, it actually, it, it, is, it applies everywhere in every field of being a business, being in education, being in other fields. This is a theory that's been applied all over the place. So if we move to the next um, model, this is exactly what we wanted. We wanted to reverse, we'll be very transparent with our planning. We wanted to reverse the experience. Usually we always start off with theory, but we wanted you to go through the process from A to Z completely, and then go through the theory. So you could actually connect to each part of it. So you've done the do it part where you experience two different way of tackling, let's say, solids or geometry. We had done the reflection part where we talked about what happened and the process we went about it, which is what it was important. And then we got you to plan lessons where we had to generalize the so what and the now what. So remember, this is not a continuum in a linear fashion, but more like a tornado. It's a continuous uh, swirl, if you want because you, you keep on building, no matter what you do, it's, it keeps on going, right? So this is the cold model. So again, based on the cold model, Dale's cone, notice that the first, um, the first quote that we started off this discussion with, uh, started off with all these percentages of ways of doing, of, of ways of, of remembering things. The percentages are not the important part. The important part is what we see on the, on the right is that, the more senses that get involved in learning, the more the understanding becomes deeper and more relevant. The, high, the less of the senses, the less we remember, the less we retain. So if we're just listening to a lecture, let's remember that, okay, if you get out of the class, how much really did you retain of that lecture, right? Versus if you go to a lab where you have to do something, how much did you actually retain? You take it out with you, right? So it's just here to show you if, if you apply any of these strategies that you have on the red, so it's like we just read or we just hear or we just like see something that the implication on what the outcome, the learning outcome can or how much do we remember of it is might be less than if we have multiple senses in action. Uh, while we're learning. So this is what refers to as active learning. And of course, this theory comes from uh, Rita's favorite uh, taxonomy. She is, uh, she is a Bloom follower. I Heart. love Bloom. <laughs> I can Ever always relate to him. To Bloom. So notice that our, our, our exams, our curriculum, everything we do is based on actually Bloom taxonomy. The lower, the Every, by the way, every stage of Bloom taxonomy has its use and it's important, but it's, it's all, it has to match the intention of the pedagogue, which is the person, the teacher. The teacher has to have an intention and choosing where you're at in, in that pyramid is really what makes that intention targetable or not, right? So, and also to know where is the student and the student could be anywhere um, different places in different subject in different strength, right? So for example, if I want the student to, to, let's say, just simply recall stuff because I am working on formulas and I want them to memorize formula for whatever reason I want them to do, remembering there's nothing wrong with remembering. But if I want them to, to we were talking about number sense and the whole idea, I want them to really understand what is something bigger than a relationship between two numbers, then probably I'm gonna go into more like the analysis, the application, the evaluation, and even to the creation part, right? But if I would go to remember, if I want them to actually understand the relation, it won't work because it's just not the same competency. So Bloom taxonomy, the higher part of that, pyramid is more that we would call the higher metacognitive um, skills that we want our students to display versus the lower part is more a lower cognitive skills. Yes. And it's, it's very um, ironic, uh, if I can say it like this, because uh, when you are in the higher of the pyramids, sometimes it starts to make sense more to you because you're in the process. So 
you can remember stuff after. So it goes. So when you have a deeper understanding of some, something, you have less chances of forgetting it. For example, whenever, like uh, for a student who is uh, learning how to uh, fix a motor in a car, you know, well, he, he may watch as many videos as he wants, but unless he really like do it one time, that's when he's gonna learn and remember all the steps. So you, when we put the student in, in, uh, and depending on our intention, but when we, we ask the student, for example, only to analyze the situation, I'm not asking you to solve it, just analyzing when he might make some connections and then he's going to be able to remember those connections easier. One to solve. But, yes. Yeah. And basically that's what it says in the, uh, uh referential, uh, in, yeah, in, the framework. Into the intervention framework that for a deeper, uh, for, for a long term, remember, it has to be more uh, deeper understanding. Mm -hmm. So if we go to the next one, notice that here you have the, the, the code model into like steps to say that just to remind you that this is more an experiential part. And mainly some, some model, you may see five steps, some model might see three steps, but some model four steps. But at the end of the day, it comes down to three, really do reflect and apply. And here notice um, you could start off with a concrete, by the way, this model doesn't mean you'll have to always, always start with an experience. You could start anywhere in these four steps, but to have a full learning cycle, you have to go through these four steps. So you may start with an, an experiment and then, and then turn into an experience and, and you can start anywhere among these footsteps. So it's a continuous process, like we said. So you have the concrete experience, the reflection and observation, you have the abstract and the um, conceptualization. And of course you have the active experimentation. So these are the four, four steps. So if we continue to the next one, notice um, a, a nicer way, I found this, this graph super interesting and it's easier for me because I'm into more mnemonics for remembering models because especially in theory, there's so many models and by the end of the day, when we get into a classroom, we just forget. Um, but this one kind of jumped to my eye and I think Rita too. I can speak yes. for myself, but I'm sure we'll hear Rita too. Yes, and I always love questions because it's uh, when we, we are working with the student, it's it's the uh, they want so badly the answer or the how to do it that it's sometimes like we want them to think about the question by themselves you know and we're like we're even when we ask a very open question we still are guiding them so it's sometimes it's very hard to formulate a question that will make the student think about what is it i'm supposed to do when i start a problem for example you know and it's okay well it's I need to identify the relevant information, you know, but yeah. sometimes when we are explaining it to the student, we're like, okay, uh, what are the important information? So we're mm. guiding the student. We're not telling him what they are, but we're still guiding him because we're telling him basically to look for the information in the text, but we want the student to remember that by himself. Mm. So it's kind of really hard, like sometimes to, to make the student be conscious, uh, conscient of uh, what are the questions he should be asking That's himself when he do a problem where is there is a lot of word. Yeah. So notice here the model, it's the way it was written. It's written experience, what, so what, now what? So this is a nice way of connecting to this model saying, okay, I lived an experience. So what just happened? And then from that, so what it happened, like, you know, so your, anal your analysis and now, now I got it. Now what, what do I do with this information? I reinvest it. Right. So here notice that we, we, we left you like uh, suggestive questions. So depending where you are in this model, these are guiding questions. You could guide your student or even yourself, like in planning, like a, let's say an experiential activity uh, based on a topic. If you want to kind of guide yourself with it just to answer it or guide your student with it so in the what you have can you recall what we just did or whatever it is and yes. the so what how can you account for that you know was it good was it bad you know and now what 
Now, what did the learner learn from this experience? So what did you learn? What would you take? What's your takeaway from what you just did, you know, from a laboratory or for whatever it is? So these kind of, it's just guiding questions to help you kind of guide the students in the process. And so the, yeah. one of my favorite questions is, can you recall? This one is very interesting because you know, like like in the beginning, we did the one with like, uh, with you poor, I chose, you know, which one would I choose between the two glasses? Uh, it was about volume. When after that, I, the student is doing a theoretical, uh, a, a problem, uh, a theoretical problem, we can always ask him, can you recall? Do you remember? You know, yeah. Do you remember a similar problem? Like, what did you do? So here it's like, but because the, the first impact of the first activity is so strong that it's going to help him remember like, oh, it's, it's true. I remember we did it that way. We compared the volume. We we converted the, the, the centimeter cube into milliliters, uh, et cetera. Yeah, we will be giving you all of these questions at the end also. Yes. So if we move on to the next one again, if this this we thought would be really really nice to have i would have loved to have this when i was teaching and and creating my problems or my exam questions or my pretest because this shows to show me what kind of question should be where like for example based on bloom taxonomy if i'm looking at the knowledge questions i'm looking at the first three columns and notice the type of questions that there is it's a lot like do you recall? Can you list? So remember, in other words, right? And move on. And notice that the last three columns, like uh, the, the the green, blue, and purple, the kind of questions uh, that we're looking like explain, justify. You're trying to go into more like you know explain your thought process. So these are super interesting questions to guide you also in writing your 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 preparing your students for whatever's yes. coming too. So, and guiding and them have, through the process. And when they do like, uh, they solve problems, student, like basically we, I always uh, hear that. And when I was teaching that, well, I had the same problem with my student. They don't know where to start. They just like, what are they asking me? And then when I see like at the question here and I'm like, oh, that is nice. You know, the first two one, the, the knowledge and the comprehension. I think it's something that it's those questions are very good, like to help the student, like these are a good uh, strategy of teaching the student where to begin. Yeah, yeah. So those those were all be giving to you as, as reference points. Now what, if we continue, if you go to the next, Okay, so now this is the, uh, the, the we, we mapped the process on how to create kind of put together experiential math activities. So if you go to the next slide, there is a bit of a prep work to do before you plan your activity. And again, we're gonna talk about where would you use this and when would you use this? This comes down to how comfortable you are with, with hands-on or experiential uh, kind of um, concrete activities in a classroom. So the preparation part, the pre-preparation part is you really have to pick the topic you wanna tackle. So if, I, if my students are really having a hell of a time with order of operation, so this is something I have in mind I would like to tackle. So I'm gonna create, I'm gonna find experiences or activities that will actually, um, will, will, will highlight that order of operation in real life situation to get them talking. And of course, I have to prepare what kind of questions I have to kind of guide them with. So having that reflection prior to it, so almost like predicting what kind of questions you will have. And notice here, we give you a list of, of, of ideas that if you're targeting specific things, so for example, if I'm looking for decision-making or problem solving, so solving problem, making models, so playing a game, teamwork, risk-taking, you know, um, communication, expert, you know, so have all of that prepared before, like, I don't think experiential learning should be on every on, on, on every topic or every single day in a classroom because then it loses its its purpose unless you're this kind of a teacher. Um, but other than that, this could be a super um, strategy, a teaching strategy that could support 
uh, difficult, difficult um, topics that you would like to kind of like bring the student like uh, to, to, to really, really understand. Now, the second part, <laughs> maps for you here, like let's say, for example, the stages, the five stages with in questions that we recommend at this stage that you kind of go over. So you do the experiment, then when it comes to reflection and sharing time, you know, go through these kind of questions with your students. Then when you come to the apply and generalize, again, guide them with these kind of the questions. And then we go to reflect on the process, guide them with these kind of questions. And when it comes to the application, guide them with these questions. So we had it all, the process mapped up with guiding questions for you to, to, to get your students to kind of reflect, to kind of internalize the knowledge. Now, you may say, sorry, I'm just like, you may say, well, where did Kobe actually come with all this, these ideas? He actually referred to what we call how do we all learn naturally there's a lot of um there's a lot of studies that was done on how humans the evolution of humans learning how do we evolve and uh, and a lot of psychological research on the 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 adaptation that we do to our environment and stuff and there was a lot of study that says of course learning is something humans do from the moment we're born, uh, from birth to the last day we die you know a baby that is just brand new figures things out, learn how to feed himself, need, learn to cry when they, 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 they want to tell you something. So we learn from birth. And eventually, like, for example, human naturally inclined to learn, like, let's say, for example, you don't see a baby sitting there for a long time, they learn to, to turn, they learn to crawl and eventually walk, right? So um, you won't tell, you won't see yourself telling your baby, well, I'm going to show you how to walk and tomorrow I'm expecting you just to walk, right? So notice the, the it's, it's a process, learning is a process. Um, and also notice <laughs> number three caught my attention, you know, and say all oh, human will learn if learning material is interesting or presenting in an interesting way. Well, curiosity, human curiosity of, of figuring things out, like how many times you tell your two-year-old, your toddler not to go and put their fingers in the plugs and they're like, just curious. Oh, there's a hole. I want to go and put my finger there. Why? It's just interesting. It's, it's curiosity, right? So if we keep on giving them opportunities where they're curious and it's, 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 it's interesting, they, you may get their attention. And by grabbing their attention is you're opening the door to, to a deeper learning opportunities. Number four is something that we actually forget sometimes that learning is not a linear process, it's a cyclical process. That means what? It's not because I showed you today something that that's it, you know it, and then I can move on to the next step. You have to keep on coming back to things. That's what it is. It's a going up and down. There's moment that, yeah, you presented it for me, but I'm going to forget. And if I keep going back to it, is that road component in time and place, it has its purpose, right? Um, uh, and I don't mean like road that we teach by road, but in if we want a skill to be taught, we need road. It's not the only way of teaching, right? So cyclical is just to make sure that we keep coming back to basic concept and, and reinforce it. So it's really sticks. Now, <laughs> we're getting close to the end, my dear friends. So let's summarize. So notice that step one, what we all did is through experience. You tried math and three act. You did number talk. Um, yeah, click on number talk if you don't mind me. Oh, before, 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 sorry. <laughs> I know I went too fast. If you remember, um, just to summarize, how do we administer or we do this? Math in three acts, there's three acts, which means there's have three stages or three videos. St the video number one, the idea behind it is just to show um, a simple video of less than a minute. 30 second, whatever, and get them to, to talk about it, question, all questions that comes to mind. And from there, make sure that you understand the question or make, we all agree on a question and then guiding them through what information do I need to solve? So get them to, to recognize what do they need to solve? Then stage two, which is mean, okay, now you have everything you need, now solve. Show me what you could do and then have a conversation about it. 
here at this stage is really to underline, to highlight the, the strategy, the, the thinking process, and of course, to validate it with the real life situation. So the answer key is actually real life, right? So that's for math three act. In terms the, of number top. The, I just want to precise that the first act, it doesn't have to be a video. It can be any question with be a the, picture. Any, yes, anything. The idea is just the first one is what can I possibly ask you? Or it just like we remove all the the les informations superflu. We remove everything. We just keep you know the the basic problem, the context, and then we just want the student to think about math problem. And then we give the 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 second part is they solve it. They can be with pair alone. And the third one is we validate all together. It's just to say that it doesn't have to be always a video. It can be anything. Yeah. And if we go for number talk, the same thing. Notice here we said present a problem that could be through an image, could be through anything. Uh, the question of saying does it belong or doesn't belong, that is just a, a, a starter, a conversation starter, giving them time to think. And the whole point is to improve their explanation, justification, their choice. It's really to, to, to get them to learn, to communicate, to think critically. It's, it's a beautiful exercise to teach them how to think critically, explain their choice and justify with word where teacher highlights the student thinking on the board, peer teaching through discussion. And of course, there's no wrong answers. At this point, we're talking about like thinking process. Yes. Okay. So now we're gonna show you what Micheline did. She did like something really amazing. Oh my God, no. <laughs> Do you all see it? <laughs> It's yeah. really nice, actually. So, yeah. So, well, Rita, you could present it. <laughs> oh, I can present it. Okay. Well, here she did like a map of uh, number talk, and uh, basically you have like all the tools, the big idea, the guiding map discussion, the extra resources. Like here, you have a lot of resources. The type of talk, like here, we have math in three acts, number talk with images, the same but different station, which one doesn't belong. And there's many more, you know, here it's just a few examples. But and when you click on the link, well, you, it's going to bring you uh, somewhere yeah. where you have more information. Uh -huh. we, you have a planning tool uh, just to give a template, but it's not uh, you can adapt it. Uh, tips for successful talk. Yeah, go to if you go to the extra resources just for fun. So these are all resources that will fall under number talk that you could use. And every link here is linked to a different strategy you could use. So like estimation 180, clothesline, black box, point dot. These are all different strategy that you could use to 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 make learning concrete. Okay, so. Uh, we're so, gonna go through some of them. I, I just uh, want to add very fast. Here you see the conceptual understanding, the flexibility, the fluidity, and the learning environment, which is very important. This is the base of being able to do those number talk is to have an environment that has the condition to allow it. It's a process, of course, because the student in the beginning they might be like like we said they maybe feel intimidated intimidated because they have intimidated. to talk <laughs> but uh, with time they become better and it becomes more fun at the end they, they will ask you like can you just do this because i'm bored now <laughs> yeah if we go to the next one here remember we had already talked about it do you have any other ways or ideas to create concrete math experience we had kind of brought it up earlier by some of you saying like you know I would do this and I would do that. Um, yeah, if you go to the next one, please. Yes. Now, notice over here, these are all ideas that you could use. Um, I can tell you, I looked at all of them and I was actually blown away about how creative teachers are in making uh, learning fun in their class. Like the closed line, number line, just to let you know what it is, it's actually something that got stuck in my head, is the teacher will have a closed line on one of the wall and he'll put like functions and like holes. Like for example, if he he, te he teaches in like the lower math, he will put like, let's say pattern and they'll, he'll leave like, for example, 
empty spot and he'll ask the students to go and fill in the empty spots. So then they'll, they all could like use it an extra work, you know, um, extra work. Uh, if they're working their book and sometimes they just want to like do something else. This is one thing of doing, you have like patterns and they have to fill in the, the, the blanks and the pattern just to show them that there's repetitive work. Um, when you're looking at the uh, estimation clipboards, so you'll have, let's say, a, a container with stuff and you want to, let's say, improve estimation. Say, okay, how many, I don't know, how many, uh, uh, I don't know, how many toys is in this box, right? And they'll have to look, or how many cans is there in this box? Let them guess a number, but then ask them, like, why? And, you know, and then actually do it, do the problem together. So tell me everything about a number. So you could put a function and say, tell me everything about it. Is it first degree? Is it second degree? How do I calculate it? What is the ABC is, uh, is, is this problem, you know? True or false, give them something and say, is it true or false, like a solution? And say, if it's true, why? And if it's false, correct it, you know? Or find the mistakes, in other words. Uh, it's same or different, you can give two different situations, two different function or two different pictures and say, are they the same or different, you know, in equivalency or, or um, you know, in pictures or whatever it is, and then show me why <laughs> you're thinking. Which one doesn't belong? We tried it, three acts math and maths moments. The math moments has a collection of other ideas too. So there's lots and lots of strategy in, in kind of being creative and showing uh, showing the students just to stimulate engagement in a classroom when we're teaching something versus just letting them on their own learning something, you know? So these are, these are all uh, things that we uh, recommend. Uh, also, when we're looking at section two, we said when we all asked you, like, how did you like these exercise? Notice that when everybody started having these conversation, it was fun. Math can be fun <laughs> because everybody felt that they disconnected that they're from in a math classroom. They, they, they just looked at the something and they said, oh, okay, I can participate. I have something to talk about these glasses and this Coke and whatever it is, you know. Uh, it made you think. The second, the second exercise when we gave you all these like four images and you're like, oh, um, uh, I have to really think it through this one. Uh, learning more than plan. The three, the three acts. Uh, Okay, learn you, 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 the students learned a lot more than what you would have given to them if you give them just something to solve. Stimulate discussion, it's relatable, and initiate questions, and everyone can contribute. It's really, really important that everybody feels that they have something to bring. Now, <laughs> this section is how yes. experiential learning, I mean, it's the very... teaching and learning. Yeah. So this one will leave you to read it most, but just to tell you, uh, like for example, one of the advantages is the ability to immediately apply knowledge. And when we're looking at the links with mathematics, we're looking at representing, connected, problem solving and selecting strategy. And these are examples on how you do that. Uh, assess real time coaching and feedback. We're looking at here, reflection, reflection. Like when you're, you're asking the student to think and, and give them feedback, you're, you're actually asking them to reflect. Um, the next one, we're promoting teamwork and communication skills, which is really important because outside of our classroom, people have to work with people. I know some of our students are having difficulty, but especially when one of the competency is communication, uh, it, it helps with that. And uh, development and reflective practice is to get them to to reason and to prove you don't need well you can give them the answer key but to 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 have um, validation of their answer does it make sense sense making and the last one is accomplishment or obvious here is making new connection and having uh, having ground to build on now. The next slide, you might say, well, what challenges with these methods? Experiential learning or experiential math have lots of challenges too. And these challenges is limited class time, limited access to resources, curriculum constraint, inadequate group work. Some people don't want to work with other people, you know, and overwhelming. It could be overwhelming to the teacher, especially if it's not their style of teaching. If I'm not a hands-on kind of teacher, how am I gonna implement hands-on activity if it's not my style of teaching? But just to think, sometimes getting 
finding a middle ground where you could kind of just remember you're doing all of this for who? And again, this is not something you could do from A to Z or every day. It could be something added when needed. Yes. Right? And very engaging for the student. Very engaging because when we think about it, a lot of our students are on, are on their cell phone when they are in class, you know? So basically, it's uh, we don't have that, huh? We don't have no, students. Not on your cell students, phones. Laura. No, exactly. So, but when they are, when you see them, you know, when they are like all like on their cell phone because they're, you know, they're exhausted. They've been having like four hours of, uh, you know, individual work where it could be a good moment to say, okay, you know, let's try something new and uh, maybe you're going to have a different uh, reaction. Even if half of them participate, it's better than having all of them on cell phones. So. Because I know, you know, when the, the four hours in a classroom for the student, the last hour, I don't know if they're very productive. I was just going to say what I can see the application of this helping us is it's like quick uh experiences and and because like yeah like i used to do like movies with my students and do a plot structure and i find that the concentration abilities even for that which is a high interest movie uh you know like i gotta go for a break i gotta go this i gotta go that they check their cell phones so i think the fact that you can maybe do these experiential learning very quickly and very encapsulated and then maybe even go back to it back and forth instead of just you know i think it makes it more uh manageable and quick and fast yeah yeah Seems I like think they so want too. quick now all the time quick 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 yeah, yeah. it's this is even the when they watch a series yeah you see them like they they go faster oh it's boring now yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is uh, but uh, some uh, of uh, some people use also you know google chat with their students so they uh, they have uh, they um, they ask the question in the group like through uh, cell phones so the student, you know, they tend to answer easier, more, they tend to more answer, like when you contact them with the, Electronic. with the Google chats. Yes. So uh, you ask them a question and then they're like, oh, well, it's that and they answer you and it's kind of cute. Uh, just to add to this, this is something it might be actually a, a, a topic for a future FNM is what is the, what is the profile of the 21st century learner? And actually, I came across a study which shows you actually what they're looking for and what kind of person they are based on all the research that's been actually been done. That could be something in the future we'll do, but just for you to understand. And, and it's great that you hit it on the on the nail. One of the thing, it has to be precise. The video, whenever you're making knowledge or, or, or video, it has to be short to the point, it cannot be general. You lose them in seconds. It has to be, I'm gonna look at the video because I need to fill in something I don't know. So get to the point, give me a, give me how to, it's when you do stuff like that, because they, they, they're like, they, they get bored, they change. It's so fast in their mind and they're always on the move. So it's another, another profile altogether, yeah. I, I that that little caricature that we had before the little cartoon I just thought it was hilarious and I I just thought that you guys would like to uh, I wanted to share it with you that one is you prefer TV or real life experiences I don't know what time does real life experience it comes on just <laughs> we get we got to that point you know so let's uh, move on to the next few. So hopefully we were able to help you recognize the benefit of, of experiential math and to get you to experience it, experience the, the code model, the rediscover, uh, rediscover the art of questioning and obviously to access a collection of resources, which we will show you in a minute. Um, we, these are all references we got our information from, but the 62 is the one I wanna show you. These are also the next one. These are all links to all the extra strategy that you may not you that you mean uh, that you may want to like check out if you want. Now we could go back to slide 60 and to tell you, thank you so much for being here. We appreciate it. And I hope uh, you learned as much as we learned today. And hopefully we'll see you in October 2023. <laughs>